Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong UK Boarding School I Festival. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Wallace Wong, and I am the Registrar of Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong. I will also serve as the moderator for today's webinar. As you may already know, for today's webinar, uh, all of our attendees will be muted uh, as we do have a lot of attendees for our iFestival today. Now for the agenda for today, we will be including school presentation from some of the top co-ed boarding schools in the UK. Each presentation will last around 30 minutes, which will consist of a 20 minute school presentation followed by a Q&A section that will take around 10 minutes. Now for the Q&A session, attendees, you are welcome to type in your questions in the chat text box. Uh, you're also welcome to type in your questions in the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen. A few of our panelists and moderators will then ask your questions to our speakers for each presentation. We will do our best to try to address all questions asked during the Q&A. In addition, you're welcome to type in your questions for the Q&A and we'll try to answer them through text as well. Now at the end of today's webinar and for each school's presentation, contact details of each school will be provided on your screen. We'll also follow up with a post-webinar survey to all of our viewers. Now without further ado, I would like to hand it over to the headmaster of Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong, Mr. Howard Tuckett. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Wallace, and good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our, the first of our uh, three webinars. Welcome to our British Schools Boarding Festival. Uh, we have so many schools for you. We have so many great speakers that we've spread it over three Saturdays for you. You're all very welcome. Uh, part of the reason that Wickham Abbey in Hong Kong has made such a great success uh, during the first year is the expertise that we offer Hong Kong families in preparation for entry to the great boarding schools of the world, but in particular, the, the British boarding schools. Over the next three Saturdays, you will be hearing more than 20 presentations from key members of staff from the top boarding schools in the United Kingdom. Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong is very proud and we're delighted to be able to share uh, so many of our colleagues in the British education, independent education world uh, with such a wide audience in Hong Kong. Today, we focus on the co-educational schools and we have key members of staff to speak to us from Marlborough, from Seven Oaks, from Rugby School and from Catrum and also from Arch Education here in Hong Kong. Next week on Saturday, the 12th of September, we will be hearing from key members of staff from the top British girls boarding schools, a whole event focused on girls boarding. And as is only fair, ladies first, uh, gentlemen will follow on Saturday the 19th, we will be hearing from key members of staff of the top British boys boarding schools. I'd like to introduce our team today to you, our hosting team. Wallace Wong has already uh, spoken to you. Wallace is our registrar. We're also joined by Nicola Ray, who is our head of drama. And Nicola will be assisting this afternoon with introducing some of our speakers. And my name is Howard Tuckett. I'm headmaster here at Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong. And I'll be speaking to you later as well about our school and how we can help you and your children prepare for entry to any of these great schools that you might care to know uh, more about. A very special vote of thanks to Ruth Benny and Top Schools for hosting our webinar on the Top Schools Zoom platform uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Ruth, for that very generous uh, help so freely given. Um, before we start, uh, our first speaker this afternoon will be uh, Julia Hodgson, who's the Director of Admissions at Marlborough, but before I hand over to Julia, we're going to hear from Mr. Patrick Sherrington, who is the chair of Wickham Abbey International Limited, and he has an introductory address for us.
Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Sherrington, and until March of this year, I was chairman of the Council of Wickham Abbey School in the UK. I was proud of my association with that school, which is a preeminent boarding school in Britain. And I'm proud of my continuing association with Wickham now as chair of Wickham Abbey International Limited, which is responsible for its international operations. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this Wickham Abbey Festival of Boarding Schools, the first event of its kind. We're delighted that so many prestigious British boarding schools have been able to join us over three consecutive Saturdays for this event. Each of the presenters are key members of staff at their respective schools, and each speaker will be presenting on an important aspect of modern British education. This event is aimed at Hong Kong parents, and I know from having lived in Hong Kong myself for nearly 15 years, how important education is to Hong Kong parents. Everything you see and hear is designed to inform you of the breadth and excellence of British boarding provision. And each speaker's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. And I would encourage you to ask as many questions as you like. Here in Hong Kong, Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong is a private British prep school. And as such, the headmaster, Howard Tuckett and his team are experts at preparing young children for their secondary schools. So please feel free to contact Howard and the team at Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong for information about boarding schools in Britain at any time. And finally, may I thank again all of those schools for their participation in this event and all of you for your attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, we are now about to start. Uh, we're a little ahead of time. I can see Julia Hodgson has joined from, from Marlborough very early in the morning for Julia. Uh, just before I hand over to Julia, um, who's just coming up now, um, Patrick Sherrington, they're speaking from Wickham Abbey in High Wickham, uh, which is about halfway between London and Oxford. Um, the Wickham Abbey International is a group of schools that is growing very fast. We have Wickham Abbeys uh, in Hangzhou, in Nanjing, in Changzhou, and Hong Kong. Uh, so for interest uh, in Wickham Abbey schools, do contact us here at Wickham Abbey Hong Kong. We'll be very happy to steer you to those other schools. All of the other schools are junior and senior combination schools, primary schools uh, with senior schools. We're the odd one out. Uh, we're a prep school. Uh, going up towards 13 plus. Um, there are plans for a senior school to be built in Hong Kong at a later point, uh, but we're not quite at that stage yet. But we're very busy building uh, on the other two sites, Nanjing and Hangzhou, and our Changzhou site is already five years old and fully operational. Anyway, we're now ready to hand over and start our, uh, our first uh, presentation. And it's a very warm welcome to Julia Hodgson, who is the Director of Admissions at Marlborough College. Julia has a degree in geography from Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge, and began her teaching career at Dulwich College in London before moving to teach in Europe for three years. Julia started work at Marlborough in the year 2000 as a geography teacher. She ran a girls boarding house for 12 years before moving to her current job as director of admissions. Julia is married with two daughters who are both currently at Marlborough. Julia, you're very welcome and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon uh, in what is very early in the morning in your case. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here despite the early hour. Thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity. Um, um, it's a real pleasure. So I'm going to speak um, a, a little bit about teaching STEM subjects, um, science, technology and engineering in the 21st century. And I'm going to try to share um, my PowerPoint, which I hope technology will um, allow me 
to do. Um, so, um, STEM teaching. STEM stands for, as you can see on the screen, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And it embraces a way of thinking about science education. Um, traditionally, really, we've taught, um, taught things in pigeonholes. We still do. Um, science in one area, technology in another engineering in another, maths in another. And the idea of STEM teaching is that if you want to be a successful scientist in the 21st century, um, you cannot teach these things in isolation. They have to be taught um, together. There has to be overlap. And most importantly, um, uh, what lies behind STEM is an idea of communication and collaboration that really the top and most successful scientists in the 21st century uh, will be able to work with each other, to collaborate, to listen to each other um, and to draw skills from different disciplines um, if they are going to succeed. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so you might ask really why we need to think differently about teaching science in the 21st century when over the last uh, um, um, several centuries we have had seen um, extraordinary developments in science that, that have achieved, achieved incredible things. So what's, what's different and, and why do we need to start teaching science differently? Um, Arguably, we are experiencing something that is called uh, the fourth um, industrial revolution. And really this involves the development of um, technologies that will completely change um, the way that we live, the way that we work, the way that we manufacture things, the way that we do business. We've already begun to see it um, in our lifetimes. Um, um, you know, when um, I was at school, the internet didn't even exist. So, um, in fact, even when I started teaching, it was only just beginning to emerge. And that has changed things radically. And things are only going to change more radically. Um, and the sort of technologies that I'm talking about are advanced robotics, artificial intelligence, virtual reality um, and, and wearables. And these are going to transform um, the way we live. Um, we've already seen it with things like 3D printing. Um, there are going to be developments in the way that energy is stored, in genomics, um, in advanced robotics, in autonomous vehicles. Um, and the World Economic Forum in, 19, in uh, sorry, 2015 um, identified some tipping points, the points at which these new technologies will really impact um, on our lives. Um, and it, it surveyed 800 high-tech specialists and they determined um, some of the following dates. Who knows, of course, exactly how accurate these are, but this is what they predicted. That by 2022, 3D printed cars will exist and 10% of people will be wearing interconnected clothes. Um, 2023, we'll see 80% of the world digitally connected, 50% of internet traffic will be directed straight to home appliances. By 2024, we'll be transplanting 3D printed organs, such as liver, and by 2025, implantable cell phones will exist. Um, and this is going to change things dramatically. Um, one figure suggests that 65% of children in school today will work in jobs that at the moment don't exist and that we probably really cannot um, imagine. Arguably, it's going to lead to the loss of large numbers of jobs. Estimates say up to 75 million jobs may be lost from traditional industries. But the good news is that they reckon up to 133 million jobs will be created by new technologies um, that will come. But the ch our children have to be prepared for those. Um, in the right way and educated in the right way. Um, arguably, all of these figures um, may be meaningless and, and may be inaccurate, but what they do point to is that we cannot know the future. We cannot know really what world we are preparing our children for. Um, but we do know that they're going to have to be lifelong learners because things are going to change and they won't be able to rely on simply what they've been taught in school. And they're going to have to be um, adaptable and resilient to change and have a really broad portfolio of skills um, if they are to flourish um, in the 21st century. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so what do we need to teach children? Well, 
ultimately, um, we need to teach them that knowledge um, is a blend and it, and it can't be um, pigeonholed in the way that we traditionally do that, that we traditionally do. And that's actually really quite a challenge for us because all schools in the UK and, 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 and really across across the world um, tend to teach things in pigeonholes. So, you know, you learn poetry and English and algebra and maths and maps and geography and the digestive system in biology and the periodic table and chemistry. And we do that largely because that's where our exam systems take us. They are examined separately. And of course, our timetables, therefore, are geared to delivering um, information that allows them to, to pass exams. Um, and don't get me wrong, that hard science, if, if we're talking about science subjects, that hard science is important. They have to be good scientists. They've got to learn the basics. Um, but anybody that um, is involved in the world of work, indeed anybody involved in life, um, will know that, that knowledge does not sit neatly in boxes. So we have to encourage children to think about learning and knowledge as a whole um, across those more traditional divides. Um, as I said before, it's very, very important that children learn how to learn because they will not stop their learning journey um, once they leave school. So in school, we have the, the traditional model of the teacher that imparts knowledge that children learn and then reproduce in an exam, but that's not going to be um, enough for our children. They're going to have to learn the skills to learn for themselves. We've seen a huge growth um, in online learning materials, even, even completely online degrees in the last few years. And this will be the way forward, I'm absolutely certain, um, as, as um, our, our children have to keep learning throughout their working lives. So it's really important that in school, we equip them with the skills of how to learn, how to answer a question for themselves, how to find, to, to trust, themselves um, to have the ability to, to teach themselves effectively. Now, of course, they must have all the support to do this while they're in school, to, to research a topic on their own, to find answers. They need to be supported and scaffolded at school, but when they leave us, they should have the skills to do that themselves. We also need to teach them um, knowledge literacy. Uh, the internet is, is a wonderful thing. If you want to find an answer, that you pop it into Google and you'll get not just one answer, but sometimes a million answers or more, um, which is fantastic. But they've got to learn what are good answers and what are not good answers, what is good science and what is not good science. Um, so teaching them to be um, selective uh, with their learning and with their knowledge and how to pick the best knowledge, that's a really key skill they need to learn too. Back to the real principles of STEM, communication and collaboration. And this is absolutely vital. Very few of the world's major problems are going to be solved by a single person working on their own um, in a science lab. Um, they're going to be solved by groups of people with different ideas and different skills that they can bring um, uh, to the problem. So it's very important that good scientists learn how to communicate their ideas um, with each other. Um, they need to communicate to their peers. They need to work in collaboration with their peers. They need to listen to their peers, understand their peers' point of view and, and, and their constructive criticism and be able to act on it. And most importantly, they need to be able to communicate their ideas to their financial backers, to their, the audience, the person for whom they are producing the product. They've got to be able to market their product. So we have to teach our children how to communicate, how to work with each other and how to communicate not just with each other, but publicly to be able to stand up and present their ideas. Um, and then we have to teach them creativity and innovation. And again, this is a vital 21st century skill. Advances in science have been fantastic. Um, and, and what it's meant is that actually science is accessible to perhaps more people than it used to be. 3D printing, single board um, computers, all of these things mean um, that actually more and more people are doing science. And it'll be those scientists that have that extra 
bit of creativity, the ability to see an answer to a question um, that no one else has, 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 has spotted, to come up with something that really meets the needs um, of people. Um, and it's, it's sort of back to that Google idea of 20% of, of spent not on your core project, um, that in, in the hope that somebody with a really wacky idea will, will hit the jackpot. Um, and, and while that's possibly a bit black and white, that idea of, of allowing students and encouraging uh, creativity, thinking outside the box, um, that's really important. Um, there's no doubt that COVID has taught us many, many, many things. Um, but but what we will what we will see from it, of course, the science we pray will find us a vaccine, will find us quick and effective testing. Um, but without all the skills required to um, finance the project, the logistics of distribution, um, the political um, persuasion, um, uh, the convincing the public of the, the safety of whatever is produced and so on, without all those skills, the science can't flourish. Um, so we need to teach our children um, a rounded and, and a broad portfolio of skills. Can I have the next slide, please? So how do we teach them? And this, this comes to the heart of it. And of course, um, like many things in education, it's, it's really hotly debated. Um, universities for some time have been using things called maker spaces where people come together, scientists, um, artists, um, economists, they come together, they discuss their ideas, um, they create the science, they make it, they make it something tangible, um, they build it, they rebuild it, and they get it 100% right. And there, there are, so these maker spaces are designed for um, exactly that. In schools, the thinking is to give pupils real life problems, come up with something to challenge them that there, there really are, um, are no issues to. How do you make a car travel 500 miles on a, without recharging its electric battery? Um, can you come up with a really useful, good looking gadget that will help people with arthritis open those pill bottles that need pushing and twisting? Real life problems for real people that need real solutions and encourage them to be as creative about the problems, the solutions to them as they can. Um, insist that they work on these in groups um, um, te make them work with their peers listen to their peers learn from their peers um, learn them to be good teach them to be good collaborative um, workers tell them who they're producing their their product for who their challenge is meant to meet what is their audience because that is vital too in the real world um, if you're coming up with a solution it is for somebody and you need to think what those people will actually want from their product. Um, and lastly, give them the skills um, to, to market their product, to stand up and talk about it. Ask them to stand up, to present, to convince, um, to convince their audience that um, their product is worthwhile. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so Marlborough, College has a bit of a history of, of innovation um, and, and thinking differently. Um, we uh, introduced business studies as a, as a whole new subject. Um, we were fundamental in the teaching of the, um, a new maths curriculum. Um, and actually, when our last science centre, well, our current science centre, um, was built in uh, 1933, um, the master at the time said, and it, it's not quite the same, but it does ring, it does ring true to me. He said, even in 1933 young scientists and their teachers need plenty of space and light and a temperate climate to do their best work i believe they will have this i hope that our new building will be a great incentive to good work and and he was on to something there it is not just the science that matters um, they need the right space the right environment to be able to think and work effectively um, and very excitingly, just short of um, 100 years on, we are looking at major changes to our um, science provision at Marlborough. So we are completely revamping um, our science block um, to give the most um, the state of the art teaching of, of core science. But we're also building something very exciting called um, the Innovation Centre. Um, can I have the next slide, please? 
plan and it will look something like this and it will be um, a direct walkway from our science block and the idea of the innovation center is that it will give exactly the sort of space that i was trying to describe for children to carry out practical applied stem learning so they'll learn their science uh, that the real core of their science in in the science block um, and other and and they will learn art and geography and history and and um, rs and philosophy and english and all those other skills too and then they will bring them together um, in this what we will call what we are calling our innovation center um, where our computing department will also uh, be housed as well to allow the science and computing and then all the other art skills to come together with these kind of collaboration spaces where they can build uh, their ideas they can bring them to reality but also with collaboration space for talking for discussing for designing beforehand and then with spaces specifically designed for presenting their ideas and then um, collaboration really lies at the heart of this uh, because the aim is to bring in all sorts of partners to work with us. Businesses, the local community, um, anybody interested in collaborating on a project with pupils at the college will be able to come in and use this space. Um, and this will be ready, we hope, very much. Building is well underway by Easter 2021. Um, and we are really looking to it to revolutionize our delivery of um, science to, to create a real, really collaborative um, STEM project um, and STEM space at the college to um, equip our children with the skills, all the skills that I've described to allow them to um, uh, achieve in, in science and um, in the 21st century. Um, can I have, I skip a slide because I've talked through the next one and then just to the end slide. Um, yeah, so if you just go to the end slide. Um, uh, and that's it for me, um, really, about STEM teaching um, and, and what we're doing at Marlborough. Um, I, I, hope that was, uh, I hope that was useful, um, but I'm very happy now to answer um, any questions that you may have um, about Marlborough General or about how we teach or our boarding or, or anything else, really. Great. Hi, Julia. Thank you for that. Thanks for your presentation on Marlborough College as well. Uh, so we do have a lot of questions coming in, so I'll uh, start asking some of them right away. And uh, feel free to answer uh, to your capacity. Um, the first question we have coming in is uh, a lot of viewers would like to understand the admissions procedure for kids uh, that are applying to Marlborough College, um, especially for those uh, that may not be coming from a UK system, like a French system sure. or IB or even homeschool. Uh, what is the procedure yeah. for that? Okay. So first of all, to reassure you, we take we have 189 pupils um, in a year group, and we but we will take pupils from well over 100 different feeder schools into any one year group. So we really have a huge range of children that come to us um, from um, all over the world, um, from the independent sector, from the state sector, from international schools, homeschool children too. Um, so we really do have um, a broad intake, you know, and 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 an increasing number of children will come with financial assistance too so there really are children from all sorts of different backgrounds so we try very hard to make the admissions process as fair as possible um, for those children who may not have come through um, a traditional prep school route so the way that we work is as follows our main point of entry is um, in year six um, we do have, we do keep a small percentage of places for children that come late to the process in year seven and year eight because life isn't simple and families' lives change and and as an international community you'll know that uh, more than most um, so we, we reserve spaces specifically for children who come late but our um, our main process takes place in um, year six where you need to enrol with us by um, uh, mid October of year six um, and this is for entry into year nine sorry to be clear because we start in year nine um, and then th what we would do is ask your child to take uh, what's called the ISEB pretest. now this is a um, it's a skills test so it's not knowledge based and therefore it should be fair across all curriculums and, and all teaching it doesn't depend really on what you've been taught it, it should be a cognitive test um, I'm aware because we've been running it for a few years now that, that some children 
despite the fact that we ask parents not to prepare them for it, are, are clearly um, well prepared. So it is only one part of what we look at. Um, we will also write to um, your child's current head teacher and ask for a reference. And again, I'm very aware that, that children at, um, at prep schools will have, will have very all-rounded references. Children coming from a different background um, may have slightly different ones, but we send a very structured form to try to make sure that we get all the information that we need. Um, and that's a very important part of what we do because we're very aware that a child's current school will know them far better than we can help to know them. If your child's homeschooled, we would take references from tutors or from sports coaches or whoever was in a position to be able to give us more information about the child. So we have the sort of cognitive test, we take information from the people that know the children best, because that's very important. And then we run an assessment day where in the normal run of things, we ask all children to come to us across one of seven days in the January of, of um, year six, they come on one of those days. Um, we're really hoping this year we can still do that. It may have to revert to being, to being virtual. Um, but on those days when we ask them to come to us, it's as much about a child looking at us as it is about us looking at them. We hope to get to know them a little bit better, um, but we also want them to get to know us a little bit better as well to make sure that they're comfortable with what we do. So on that day they would come, um, uh, we'd give them a welcome and a drink and a biscuit. They do two very short writing tasks for us. They're not assessed. One's a questionnaire about their interests and the other they write us a little story based on a picture that they've got. And all that happens with those is they go to the interview with them that they're going to have as prompts. We don't mark them, they're simply to make the interview run a little bit more smoothly. They will then go off and have, um, we give them a good lunch, or they meet some of our older pupils and they can have a chance to chat with our prefects. They go off and meet the housemaster and housemistress or the, the, of, of a boarding house and they will have a chat with them and get a chance to have a look at the boarding house and meet some of our younger pupils. Um, and, and that's their assessment day. And then in making our decisions, we put together the ISEB test, um, the uh, reference and the and the two interviews that they have and that is as an all round makes the, the our judgment because we're looking to build a real community of, of diverse people with diverse talents. Um, they do need to be academically able enough for our curriculum which is quite traditional um, but once they're there all round skills, different interests, different backgrounds, um, uh, different personalities. Uh, we are looking to build that, that diversity, um, uh, which makes our community really quite special. Uh, th thank you, Julia. Um, that is really good information for all of our viewers. Now, um, with all of our attendees today, many of us are based in Hong Kong. And, and the next question always comes up is, um, specifically for Hong Kongers, how, how, is, um, how is the admission process? Uh, do you do any interviews uh, specifically here in Hong Kong or do Hong Kongers need to apply just like as anyone else? And then you also mentioned that uh, you are looking for diversity. So uh, a, a question that a lot of our viewers have been asking is what is your ratio between local and international students at Marlborough? So um, we do ask, let's say under non-COVID conditions, all pupils to come to us. Um, the reason being, as I think I alluded to earlier on, we want to make sure that the child is as comfortable with us as we are with them. Um, so I wouldn't want to offer a child a place in a boarding school where they're going to come and live for two thirds of their lives if that child hasn't come, visited the college, met the staff and the other pupils and says, yep, I want to come to Morgan too. I'm really, I enjoyed my day. I think it's somewhere that I could thrive. Um, uh, so that's why we, um, we asked children to come to us. And I, and I do understand that for overseas parents, um, it, it is quite an ask, but I think it's, um, to be fair to the child and to the family, it's really, really important that they've, they've visited us and get a sense of, of, of what, what the college is about. Um, because it's such a business choosing the right senior school and it is a very personal thing. Um, so that's 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 the first that's the first thing um, in terms of our diversity so we are 10 percent we, we are building on this year on year um, we are 10 percent non-uk national and nearly 20 percent live overseas some of those non-uk nationals will live in the uk and some of our overseas pupils are uh, British but they live overseas if you see what I mean so it's a slightly complicated statistic um, 
but we are a very full boarding school so we are genuinely full at weekends um, we have perhaps 90 percent of our pupils with us we don't lock them away they can go home if they wish but they choose not to um, i live five minutes walk from school both my girls are full boarders they choose not to come home and be full boarders because they have fun at school and that's great um, and it is very much the culture at Marlborough is full boarding so i think if you're an overseas family looking for a school in the UK where your child can't come home every weekend because they, they, they're they too far from home. Um, you know, we provide that full boarding and that does generate a lot of overseas interest because they know that, that at the weekends their children are going to be um, happy and engaged and, and, and with their peer group. Um, so, um, so we do, so we have up to 20% to of our children, just under 20% of our children living overseas. Um, and just to clarify for all of our viewers, um, Year six, what is the age equivalent right now? Because in Hong Kong, our system is a little different. Of course, so, so they are 10 or, yeah, 10 or 11. 10 yeah. or 11. Great. Yes. And then we would just go each year up. Um, so year yes, seven, exactly. Well, so year nine exactly. will be 13. Yeah, so they begin with us aged 13. They begin Great. with us aged 13. Uh, thank you. And um, our next question is, um, I, uh, we did have a few questions regarding uh, the STEM teaching, which was what you were uh, presenting on. Now, how is the government support uh, for STEM teaching in the UK? Um, here in Hong Kong, uh, local government policy does support local schools. Uh, I think some of our viewers want to know how STEM teaching is incorporated and emphasized at Marlborough, uh, and if there's any government support for that as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're being an independent school. We, um, other than than following the exam board curriculum, we are to to, to a point free to um, to teach how we we wish. And and in a way, one of the limitations of our curriculum, as I, I suggested, is that actually um, teaching is it is still pigeonholed into those sciences. But what we have the freedom to do. Um, and particularly as a full boarding school where children are, are on site with us 24-7 and are therefore our days are, are much longer than they would be in a day school, um, is to look for those opportunities in the curriculum to offer the time and the space for collaboration outside the, the sort of teaching so through um, uh, teaching um, design technology and through um, extension and optional sessions um, through having the labs open even at weekends where children can come in and work on their um, work on their projects um, and uh, even do their presentations and all those sorts of things that happen outside the normal um, perhaps the normal fairly short hours of the teaching day um, that allows us to build in the sort of collaboration um, that, is, that is harder to do um, in, in a much more sort of pressured environment where they've got to get through the requirements um, the requirements of the curriculum. Um, I mean there is quite a big STEM movement um, uh, in the UK, the UK with lots of um, speakers and, and, and projects and so on but the curriculum in itself has yet to really evolve um, completely that way and that's why um, we're sort of carving out space for it our, our, ourselves. Um. Sure, thank you. And I, I believe we probably just have uh, time for one more question. Now, um, a lot of our uh, viewers are uh, asking about the admissions process. Now, uh, how um, strict do you, does Marlboro abide uh, by your age cutoffs in your, in your application periods? Now, um, does that mean uh, we, if students miss the age cutoff by a few weeks or so, they would have to apply for their age, you know, um, their age date, or uh, is there any leeway? Uh, no, uh, certainly not by a few weeks. Certainly not by a few weeks. Um, the, and, and also, it depends a little bit why. Um, you know, why a child would be so. Um, I would say the only thing that. I mean, we, we are a little bit concerned about it. The, the, the reason being, again, that as a full boarding school, if I have a child who is, let's say, um, very young for their year that want to come in, um, they will be in a full boarding environment with children well over a year older than them, um, right from the word go. And at 13, that can be a huge difference. Um, and I, I have concerns sometimes that a child that's very much too young for the year might struggle. And similarly, at the other end, if you have a child that turns 19, say, in the December before they leave us, and they're still in a boarding school where we're telling them to 
be in the boarding house at 10 o'clock at night and go to bed and all of these things um, and that can be quite tough if they're very much too old um, so we do offer some leeway um, of, of a, a, a little bit either side but generally a little bit and not um, not too far out of our range because otherwise I think it becomes actually quite difficult um, for the child. It's such an immersive experience um, that if you're very out of kilter, then I think it can be a little bit difficult. Um, but it's not an absolute cutoff. Great. Uh, thank you, Julia. And uh, I believe that's all the time we have with you for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining. So before I let you go, do you have any parting words for our guests today? That, um, and anything about Marlboro College that you'd like to share for our viewers? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for listening. Um, and okay. obviously, we'd love you to be in touch um, if, if you are interested. Um, I, I would encourage you, it is, schools are so personal. Um, I, I did have a, 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 a family visited us once, and um, the English wasn't their first language that they said I think you need to smell a school to really understand it and I know exactly what they meant I think that's right um, I think there is something about visiting um, uh, you know narrow schools down do your internet research think about the sorts of schools that you might want and narrow it down but I think it's really important to visit to get the feel of a school um, a little bit like buying a house there will be a right one um, you're telling me yeah actually I, this this just feels right um, and and I think that's that's probably um, really important but um, good luck with the process and all the the decisions that um, that you have to make and and if we can see at Mulber and help you in any way, we'd be um, delighted to. Thank you so much, Julia. And, and just a reminder to all of our viewers today, if you would like to learn more about the admissions process at Marlboro, the contact details are on your screen right now. Please do visit the Marlboro College website, uh, which you can also get a link to uh, for our webpage for this event. Uh, Julia, thank you uh, for your time. I uh, really appreciate you joining us and uh, we look forward to having you join us again soon. Thank you all for listening into the presentation from Marlboro College. Uh, we will begin the next school on our list, uh, which is our very own Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong. Now, before I introduce uh, our headmaster, Mr. Howard Tucker, just would like to provide a some background and information on Howard's expertise. So Howard's trained as a teacher in Natal, South Africa. He's taught in independent schools in South Africa, Botswana, England, and now Hong Kong. Now, over the last 20 years, Howard has been a prep school headmaster at St. Joseph's College in Suffolk and Caterham School in Surrey, which Caterham will also be joining us uh, later today in this iFestival event. And Howard is currently the founding headmaster of Wickham Abbey School in Hong Kong. Howard's also married with two children. Uh, now, without further ado, I would like to pass it over to Howard. Uh, Mr. Howard Tuckett, thank you. Thank you, Wallace. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, hopefully uh, the share screen has worked. You should all be able to see my dark blue slide. Is that clear, Wallace? Yes. Yeah? Yes, we okay. can see it. So, and now you can see the picture of Wickham Abbey in the UK. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, great. Yes, Good. So uh, just uh, after uh, Julia's adventures, I'm just checking that our, our technology is, is all working. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for being with us. Um, it, it's wonderful to be able to present uh, Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong uh, to such a, a, a wide audience. And initially, we had intended to host this event in our own school and have the speakers from the United Kingdom join us on screen. And of course, with the, um, the spike in COVID cases in Hong Kong, that is no longer possible. But actually a positive benefit has been that we can expand the audience many, many times uh, more. So we're, we're talking to several hundred people uh, right now and we know there are, there are others who are uh, due to join us on the other Saturday. So Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong. We are uh, part of the Wickham Abbey International School group, um, as I was explaining earlier, um, for anybody who's just joined us, there are currently four uh, Wickham Abbey International Schools. Two are just coming to the end of their construction, uh, Wickham Abbey Hangzhou and Wickham Abbey Nanjing are both about eight months away from completion. Uh, the sites are very exciting sites, they're huge campuses, 
And if you would like to get a, an idea of the size, do have a look at our oldest school in our international group, which is Wickham Abbey Changzhou, uh, which is now in its sixth academic year. Um, and the slide you see in front of you is the, uh, the main house building of our parent school, Wickham Abbey in, in England. And uh, Wickham Abbey is in the town of High Wickham, which is about halfway between uh, the cities of London and Oxford, heading up in a northwesterly direction from central London. It's a girls' senior school. Um, our founding school is a girls' senior school. Our school is a co-educational prep school here in Hong Kong. And the other schools in Changzhou, Nanjing, and Hangzhou are K-12 uh, right through, taking from little tiny five-year-olds right through to uh, big six formers who are heading off to universities. But to come back to Wickham Abbey uh, UK, just for a moment, as you can see, it is a, a, an old school. It's uh, well over a century old and is one of the leading boarding schools in the United Kingdom. Uh, for more specific information about Wickham Abbey UK, do join us this time next week. And the, the uh, new headmistress, uh, Mrs. Duncan, and several guests, I believe a former pupil and a current pupil, uh, will be joining us uh, to present about Wickham Abbey. So I'm not going to steal their thunder and say too much more, uh, but you can see from the information uh, that we come from a very viable, a very credible uh, secondary boarding school in the United Kingdom. Wickham Abbey is almost all boarding in the United Kingdom, and each of our boarding schools in mainland China uh, have large boarding capabilities as well. <clears throat> so enough about all the other Wickham Abbeys. Let's talk about us, my favorite subject. So this is our Wickham Abbey here in Hong Kong. We're on the beautiful south side of Hong Kong Island. Uh, you can just see some of the tower blocks uh, from Aberdeen. Uh, behind us there, we're actually in Tinwan, which is between Aberdeen uh, as you head around towards Pok Bulan. Uh, we're just over a year old. In fact, today is our birthday. It's just dawned on me. Today is the 5th of September. We're one year old today. We opened on the 5th of September uh, 2019, uh, and the first children walked in through the doors in their uniform. Bang on the day we said we would. We opened on time. The building was uh, finished very well. Uh, and as you can see in the picture, it's a very handsome building. Uh, it's about four stories high, and we have a large outdoor space as well, which I'll be showing you in a moment. We are fully equipped to be an outstanding prep school. Uh, we're not an international school. We have a private school license. Um, we are, uh, actually, that's not a very interesting slide. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's, let's go back to um, this one here. Sorry, I pressed that by mistake. We're, we're not an international school. We're a private school. And that means we have no quotas of uh, pupils to restrict our admissions system. Any child in Hong Kong who can legally live in Hong Kong, whether they be Hong Konger or expatriate, are all able to join us. We do not have to stick to any criteria of uh, which, which nations they come from as an international licensed school does. Therefore, we are perfectly placed. We are based on the British prep school. Our curriculum is exactly the same as the ones I've been working on for the last 20 years in British prep schools designed to feed children through to the very best secondary schools in the world, whether those be any one of our excellent Hong Kong secondary schools, and our own secondary school will be following in the not too distant future, or to any of these magnificent schools that we're hearing from this afternoon and over the next two Saturdays. We are a prep school on the British model so that children at our school in Hong Kong are following the British curriculum leading up to the ISEB, examinations that Julia Hodgson mentioned just now, and based on the British national curriculum, merged with the Hong Kong primary EDB curriculum so that we got the best of both primary curriculums um, designed for children so that they have all kinds of options when they leave us. Uh, this slide is here uh, a little about me. Um, I'm a career prep school person. I've been a prep school teacher, a deputy head teacher, I've been a head of English, a head of maths, I've been a head of games and sports, um, and uh, I, I, I'm a schools inspector. Um, so I, I've uh, come to this job to found the school, the privilege of my life, I have to say, to start a prep school from scratch. How many of us get that opportunity? Um, and, but I come from a very strong prep school, pri independent primary teaching uh, background. We have very 
um, specific objectives for each of our pupils, young as they are, impressionable as they are. And these 12 objectives that we have in this middle column, the, the blue column on this slide, these are the things that we measure our children against, age appropriately, according to their age, according to their abilities, how do they stack up against these 12 criteria? How are they, uh, Julia, I'm so encouraged just now to hear Julia talking about in their STEM teaching at Marlborough about how children will need to work together. And this is collaborative teaching. Problems are solved collaboratively, not by people locked away in individual rooms. And it's exactly the same for children, but it's a skill that has to be learned. Children, as we know, are in inward looking when they're very young. It's all about me. It's this, they've got this self-protection uh, natural uh, reflex. And of course, they need to learn to share. As parents, we're always saying, share your toys. Give your brother the thing he wants, and, and so on and so forth. And that's the beginning of collaborative learning, problem solving together. And we work our way down adaptability, confidence, resilience, independence, consideration for others, and so on and so forth. At each stage, as we compose our reports to you, to mum and dad, our reports to parents, whether that's at a parents' evening or whether that's in a written report, as well as our academic data, we're looking down these 12 objectives. As I've already explained, uh, our curriculum is tailor-made for the school. We bring a British-based prep curriculum to enable children to prepare for a whole range of different secondary options, whether it's a British boarding school, a day school here in Hong Kong, uh, maybe your careers, mum and dad, will be taking you to Australia, to Singapore, to Canada, to the States. We talk to senior schools all around the world. And what we have is an, the best core independent school curriculum to give you give your child that best possible background to prepare and, and it was again it was encouraging to hear Julia, Julia say just now and I know that other speakers will be touching the, on this that finding a senior school for your child whilst they're still at primary school is about matching the child to the school in Britain alone there are more than 500 independent secondary schools not all of them are boarding a good number of them are boarding but there are loads of great brilliant day schools as well. We have many, many more wonderful schools than we could possibly ever use. And it's not just a matter of picking out a name, Marlborough or Catrum or Rugby, or, and just thinking that's the school I'm going to send my child to. We need to get to know your child. And by working through a school such as ours, where we have an expertise and links with all these schools, as your uh, little Freddie or your little Susie uh, grows up and we get to know the Freddiness of Freddie or the Susiness of Susie, we get to know the character, we can start to make suggestions to you, mum and dad, about the kinds of secondary schools uh, that we think would be a good fit for this emerging uh, young person. So as you can see, going back to the slide, our curriculum comes from three uh, main courses. Uh, the, the British National Curriculum, the um, including British Common Entrance, the Hong Kong EDB Primary Curriculum, and we also teach a lot of Chinese, and I'll be coming on to that uh, in a moment. These are our 14 subjects, academic subjects that we teach at Wiccan Abbey Hong Kong. Um, they are the 14 subjects required by Common Entrance, the ISEB, uh, not Chinese specifically, but a modern foreign language. And of course, in Hong Kong, that would be Chinese. Um, our teachers are UK trained or similar. And by similar, I'm South African trained, so are several other colleagues, Australians, New Zealand's, Canadians, uh, some states in the United States. Um, and we are all trained in the curriculum uh, th that we teach. We follow a holistic education where we are looking to educate the whole child. As you'll have heard from Julia just now, more than half of Marlborough's um, decision-making process comes from interview and only a quarter of it comes from academic um, testing on the day. Uh, it's a much broader decision than that. And so our education, the offer that we offer our children is much broader than just the very good academic uh, education that we give. We are in Hong Kong and therefore our children need to be able to have their Chinese linguistic abilities um, backed up and supported. We teach Chinese for exactly the same amount of time each week as we teach English. Uh, we teach Putonghua with simplified characters. Our reasoning is that this is going to be the language of business in this part of the world. 
in the broader part of this part of the world, not just Hong Kong, and we are preparing children for professional life. Although many of our children at Wickham Abbey, Hong Kong may go off to boarding schools for their senior school option, our information, our sense is that most of them will come back uh, to live their adult lives in this part of the world, and they need to be uh, equipped accordingly. Um, our Chinese curriculum is taken from the Chinese mainland curriculum, and we teach each class, we put two teachers into each lesson, and each class has a native speaking ability group and a non-native speaking ability group, and we have two specific curriculums, uh, one for each group. If children do very well in the non-native speaking group, they can transfer up. A lot of our Chinese teaching is based in Chinese culture, and we don't just teach the uh, simplified characters in isolation. Of course, the simplified system comes from the traditional system, and a lot of reference is given to the traditional system as well. If children come to us knowing um, characters from the traditional system, they're very welcome to use them. They wouldn't be marked down. Um, I'm moving on at quite a rate because there's another speaker coming after me. We have a specific webinar on how we teach Chinese and we'll be putting that out um, within the next couple of weeks or so. So do watch this space or just get in touch with us and we'll happily uh, have Jenny Chen, our deputy head who's in charge of Chinese, uh, speak to you in detail about how we teach Chinese. This whole day-to-day uh, -day, though is about boarding schools. Uh, a picture from a school that's actually not participating today, this is Prior's Field. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Andy Vanikirk, is a boarding master there. Um, and this really just, this picture underpins the care and the preparation that needs to go into preparing a child for boarding. It's not just about academics. And a school like ours at Wickham Abbey School, Hong Kong, we are preparing the whole child, as I said just now, a holistic education. Now, we will get to know you, mum and dad, very well. And as you go through the journey of being a primary school parent, you will be thinking and making decisions, and we are here to support you in that. If as your child progresses through the school, you feel that you would like to explore the option of what British boarding might look like, how that might work, we are here to help you and to introduce you to all the wonderful schools that we will be hearing from um, over these three weeks, and indeed others um, that are also there who just couldn't join us on this occasion. Be absolutely confident that all boarding schools in the United Kingdom are very well regulated. The independent education system in England is so highly thought of that Her Majesty's Inspector um, Ofsted have given the independent schools license to have their own inspectorate an ISI, an independent schools inspectorate that is ultimately responsible to Her Majesty's inspector, but is a specialist inspectorate for uh, boarding schools and day independent schools. All, all the um, uh, major boarding schools you're hearing from and all of the others will belong to any one or a combination of these professional associations. All of the schools are very well regulated, they're all very well run, and I'm sure you'll get the sense of that from the quality of people you'll be hearing from today. Um, but again, as you come through us at Wickham Abbey, Hong Kong, we will be able to give you all this background information about the schools, which associations they belong to, what their last inspection report looked like, what the inspection report actually means. We'll be able to unpick all this teacher speak for you um, and be able to present it to you in terms that you need to know. Uh, at Wickham Abbey Hong Kong, we will help you through uh, school selection, uh, as I've just been saying. And then once you start to make choices, the application uh, will be helping your little boy or your little girl with their interview preparation. Interview, the presentation of the child, uh, is so important. It's, as I've been saying before, and Julia said before me, it's so much about the right fit, the right person going to the right school. Uh, these are huge decisions, and uh, the last thing we want is anybody to be miserable uh, in their boarding school, uh, for those who go off to boarding schools. And again, as these red blocks at the bottom uh, show you, we will be helping with assessment, preparation, uh, or any contact uh, before, while you're just inquiring, while you're going through the admissions process, we will be there to support you um, should, it, should you find any difficulty from Hong Kong in uh, making contact. And of course, planning the academic um, trajectory and the mentoring. 
Uh, we have dedicated members of staff here who help our children prepare for life as a boarder whilst the school is preparing the academic side um, and the, the more sort of holistic side. We have dedicated members of staff. You can see uh, Mrs. Harrison here talking to two of our girls and she and others like her are helping our children who are interested in boarding to prepare for life as a boarder. All of that goes on here in Hong Kong at a day primary school um, in preparation for these big moves. Uh, a few pictures of our school. You can see our three story high uh, atrium here, uh, a, th a three and a half story high climbing wall, a cutaway section of the building. Uh, for any information about our school, do go to our website. There is an interactive tour, uh, rather like Google Map, and you can navigate your way around the school. Um, just a few slipped shots here. Uh, these are some of the classrooms. Uh, again, the atrium on the left. Uh, Nicola Ray is with us today. This is her drama studio um, uh, on the floor below me at the moment. Our music studio on the left. Uh, one of our two art studios, uh, with, which has its own roof garden. Uh, you can see in the picture on the right. These are our STEM uh, facilities. We have our own drone racing room. Uh, children are designing and drone um, making and adapting drones. You can see some of our 3D printers here as part of our STEM uh, work. And of course, STEM covers all kinds of robotics and technology. And also what I would call good old, good old yogurt cup technology as well. Children doing engineering with straws and yogurt cups and problem solving collaboratively and working out uh, on all the pressures and forces uh, that they need to. We are so proud of this bit. We've just finished getting this surface down. Uh, you can see in the picture on the top, you can see the main school building on the left and our rooftop on the car park beside us is also ours. Um, by way of comparison of size, if you look into the right hand corner of the top picture, you can see a standard Hong Kong um, uh, playing surface area. Uh, it's the uh, playing field in Tin Wan. Uh, that's a sort of a size, sizable football pitch. And you can see uh, how big our own rooftop area is in comparison. We have AstroTurf, we have the red rubberized running uh, surface, jogging track, and at the far end, the dark blue, the, or the bright blue rather, that's a hard painted surface for a ball bouncing basketball, uh, netball, uh, tennis set, or anything like that. So we have a, a lot of outdoor area for Hong Kong, uh, which we're very pleased to be able to share with you. Our school day is a pretty normal one. Uh, we start teaching at 8.30, we go through to three o'clock. Then we have two one hour in the, in the pale blue shadows, two one hour ECA sessions every afternoon. And at the moment, um, as we're welcoming children back to school in about 10 days time, uh, we'll be offering, uh, I think it's 32 different clubs and activities in the afternoon. Our admissions uh, process is really simple. Do contact us through our website and the next slide will give you the contact details as well. Um, our assessment uh, process is um, very straightforward, very simple. Uh, our team are very uh, adept at helping you through. It is not a traumatic process at all. I know entering some schools as an interview and uh, signing up can be quite a scary process. We work really hard to make it as friendly and as helpful and as smooth and enjoyable for you and your child. And we do look forward to you uh, getting in touch with us. There we are, I've rocketed through um, a presentation on our own school here in Hong Kong. We do have a few minutes uh, before we're joined by our next speaker from Seven Oaks. Uh, so I'll hand back to Wallace if there are any questions that I can answer in the next few minutes. Thank you, Wallace. Thank you, Howard. Uh, yes, so let's begin the Q&A. We do have a few questions coming in, so we'll try to address uh, most of them to the best of our ability. First, first question always is, uh, what years are currently offered uh, at Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong? Um, and we noticed that it's a primary school. Are there any plans for any secondary school in Hong Kong? Yes, thank you. So currently we're taking children in from year one. So they're five, five years old, turning six, right up to year six, uh, which is the same year six that Julia Hodgson was talking about. So they're 10 years old when they start turning 11. Next year we'll be opening um, year seven. Uh, which will be uh, 11 to 12, and the year after, or even next year, if we have the, uh, the, the demand, we'll be able to open year eight. So we'll, we'll be going up to 13 plus next year. In this current academic year, uh, we're going up to year six. Uh, we have three year ones, three year twos, and then one, and starting to open other classes, 
being that we're only a year old, um, in those other primary years. So we have spaces, uh, we are a, a new school, so admissions at the moment are open, but the school has already doubled in size in the last three months. So uh, we do advise that if you're interested uh, to open up, and they sorry, to, uh, to contact us uh, so that we can uh, open up the admissions process to you. Um, sorry, Wallace, I forgot the second part of the question. Uh, secondary. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, so, yes, we do have a plan for a secondary school. Uh, the site uh, is, going, is still being decided on. Uh, on Wickham Abbey International, we're still very busy completing uh, the Nanjing and Hangzhou sites. Uh, Hong Kong is next. Because of the size of site, the size of campus, uh, we will be providing Hong Kong. Uh, the school will need to be in the new territories. It will be many acres big. Um, we have boarding houses, academic houses, offices, administration, uh, with lawns and uh, all of the other houses, all of the other schools have facilities for rowing. So vast expanses of water as well. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to making an announcement very soon. Thank you, Howard. And, and the next question is, as many of our viewers are asking, now what is the exact relationship between Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong and Wickham Abbey School in the UK? And furthermore, on top of that is, is there direct uh, automatic transfer for those that attend Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong? Yeah, thank you. The obvious question. Um, so Wickham Abbey UK is a standalone school who started their own international project. The international project comprises of our four schools, the three in mainland China and our one here in Hong Kong. We are part of the same foundation of schools, but Wickham Abbey in England and UK is a standalone school. The international part of Wickham Abbey is a separate group. That means that pupils, if you need to move between the cities of Hangzhou, uh, Changzhou, Nanjing or Hong Kong, you can freely transfer your children uh, between the Wickham Abbeys uh, in the international group, but there is not automatic entry for little girls who leave us here in Hong Kong to just get a place in Wickham Abbey in the United Kingdom. They would need to apply and they would need to be accepted. That said, being a British prep school in Hong Kong, our little girls here are going through exactly the same curriculum, exactly the same education, taught by teachers who are trained in exactly the same places as all girls in England are doing. So you are advantaged by being at the school because you're in the same system as all other children, uh, but there is not a guaranteed pass uh, Wickham Abbey is heavily oversubscribed. I believe they take one child in 30 at 11 plus. That was the statistic I heard some time ago, but I have no reason to believe that's different. Um, and so our girls um, will need to apply. Of course, we all know each other very well in the Wickham Abbey group. And if I really felt that a little girl really was uh, a great choice, a great uh, fit for Wickham Abbey, um, I would be uh, speaking to uh, Mrs. Duncan and to the registrar and sharing my thoughts with them. But again, the decision is theirs. Thank you, Howard. And I believe uh, we just have uh, time for one more question. Now, uh, it is just going back to the relationship. What is the advantage of having uh, one of our attendees' children attend Wickham Abbey School Hong Kong? Uh, is there an advantage or benefit for, uh, for these children if they're look into transition to boarding schools uh, abroad in the future, especially if it's Wickham Abbey School UK or any of the other schools that we're featuring in these next three weekends. Certainly, thank you. Uh, yes, I'd say there is an advantage. Uh, the two points really are that our curriculum is exactly the same as a British prep school's curriculum. It's just been adjusted to make it culturally relevant. So instead of French and Spanish to all children, we teach uh, Chinese, although for our older children, we will be offering French, Spanish and German as after school options. Um, so that's just an aside. Um, I, I believe I'm, I'm told that the reason why I was offered this job was my expertise in British prep schools to bring to Hong Kong the expertise to run a British prep school here in Hong Kong to help Hong Kongers prepare for entry to these great British boarding schools if they wish to go. And um, you know, certainly not everybody will. Um, and we will prepare children, or we do prepare children equally well for whichever secondary school uh, they're going to, whether it's Hong Kong, 
somewhere else in the world, Australia, uh, Singapore, the States, Canada. But we do have a specific um, expertise and experience in preparing children and the curriculum to back up preparing children for entry to the British independent system. So yes, you are advantaged by being here. The other thing is we're not an IB school, unusually for a British school in Hong Kong. We are teaching British national curriculum, which leads into GCSE, IGCSE and A-levels. We are not teaching international baccalaureate. Thank you, Howard. Um, I believe uh, that's all the time we have uh, for your session today. Now, uh, before uh, I let you go, do you have any uh, last words for our attendees about our school? <laughs> Thank you, Wallace. Well, well, I hope if nothing else has uh, come out, I've, I've been gabbling my way through to try and tell you everything about our school that I can. I am so excited about this school. It's the privilege of my life to be founding it. Uh, we're right here in Hong Kong. Please do just um, uh, get in touch with us. You can see the contact details now. Come and have a look. We would be delighted to show you around. We really do genuinely believe, and I say this uh, from a whole career of teaching, we believe we have something very special to show you and to share with you and your families. Thank you very much for your attendance. Enjoy the rest of the session. And again, my, my thanks to all our guests who are joining us. Thank you very much, Wallace. Thank you very much, Howard. Um, Sorry, thank you, Nicola. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Nicola Ray. I'm the head of drama here at Tokyo Mabi School, Hong Kong. And it's great my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Mr. Jesse R. Elzinger from uh, Seven Oaks School in Kent. He's the headmaster there. He joined Seven Oaks this September, and he was previously the headmaster at Reading Coat School in Berkshire, which he joined in 2016. During his tenure at the school, he enjoyed the best academic results in its history, and Jesse ex expanded the school's innovative outreach and partnership program, created a strong network of charities and partner schools within the local community, and established a thriving development office. Before this, Jesse was director of studies at Harrow, where he broadened the school's academic curriculum. Previously, he worked at St. Edward's School in Oxford as director of studies and as IB coordinator. He helped introduce IB diploma at St. Edward's and he was a residential assistant housemaster. He started his career at Whitgift School as a teacher of th theology and philosophy, the assistant head of sixth form and the theory of knowledge coordinator. He studied at Harvard University where he gained his BA honors cum laude in comparative religion and philosophy and at Oxford University where his MST focused on ethical th philo philosophy. Jesse was a three-time national champion rower at Harvard and Oxford, where he became a competitive cyclist, twice racing against Sir Bradley Wiggins in the British Time Trial Championships. Although Jesse is keen to point out that Sir Bradley won by quite a significant margin on both occasions. Jesse is also an Ironman triathlete and a marathoner. And since moving to Seven Oaks, he can be spotted in the early morning running around Knoll Park. Jesse's wife, Elena Elzinger works in the investment team at the Wellcome Trust. Jesse and Elena enjoy cooking, barbecuing, traveling, and they are friends of the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden and supporting members of the England Rugby Club. They have three daughters and live in Seven Oaks near the school. And it was great pleasure I pass the floor to Mr. Elzinger. Jesse, can you turn your microphone on for us? Yes, so Thank I'm you. just unmuting and getting my presentation up with the moment. So Jesse will be talking about performing arts and education, which is obviously an area very dear to my heart. Great. Okay, I'm, I'm just checking, Nicola, you've got the right slide up, not presenter mode, yes? Yes, I see your full screen. Off you okay, go. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Good afternoon to everyone in Hong Kong and good morning here from England. It's a beautiful sunny morning in England today. My name is Jesse Elzinger. Thank you to Nicola for the warm introduction. I am the headmaster at Seven Oaks School. Seven Oaks School is just 20 minutes southeast of London in the county of Kent. Now, this is my fifth year as a headmaster, but my first week as headmaster of Seven Oaks School, I just started on the 1st of September. But what a privilege it is to speak to so many of you in Hong Kong in my first week. 
And it's lovely to have the opportunity this morning to speak to you about performing arts, which plays an important and central role in the education of our students and many British schools more widely, of course. Now, I acknowledge it seems a bit gratuitous to speak about the importance of performing arts to families living in the Far East, where, of course, traditions of dance and theater arts date back to 1000 BCE. And I'm sure I don't need to talk about the importance of this genre for our cultural understanding. Actors and musicians engage the mind, the body, and emotions into collaborative expressions of all that it means to be human. And of course, an appreciation of our own culture and other cultures enriches our lives. But the emphasis on performing arts within the British education system is much greater generally than traditional schools in the Far East. This is an image of students in the Sackville Theatre, which is just one performance space that we have here at Seminoke School. And you can see the importance placed on performing arts when you look at the extraordinary facilities developed by British schools like ours, which enable the educational experience of being involved in the performing arts to be as sophisticated as possible. This is one of the lighting and sound booths in one of the theaters at our school. And as you can see, this allows opportunities for young people to get involved in the technical side of running a production as well. Many of, that, many of those aspects today are quite advanced involving working with sophisticated computer programs. There also has to be ample space backstage for wardrobe changes and costumes. And here we even have a slide of some of our sixth form girls helping our sixth form boys learn how to put makeup on before they go out on stage. At Seven Oaks, it's fair to say that we always have a play rehearsing or performing. Now, granted, in the times of COVID-19 in the last few months, this has been a little bit curtailed, but it is fair to say in normal times that we always have a, either a rehearsal or a performance in line. We have many flexible spaces as well that can be used for either drama or music. And here's an image of a recording studio. Now we do some small concerts, we do chamber concerts, small ensembles, but we also have large orchestral and choral performances. And here you see our whole school theater and the full stage which, where we can sit hundreds of people for a big concert. Of course, our musicians and drama students are, have many opportunities to travel around the world and to go on tours and concerts. And in drama specifically, we run a tour to Germany every year and I will speak a bit more about this later on. So why do we believe so strongly that the performing arts must have precious time, resources, and a central role within the curriculum of our education system? Well, theater makes the widest and most varied range of demands. Like sport, it is physical and collaborative, but it also requires intellectual and emotional commitment. Like music, theater is creative and interpretative, but unlike music, it asks participants to imagine what it might be like to be another human being in a different set of circumstances. And this is crucial to its educative power. Many pupils relish these varied demands. They enjoy being part of a creative process to which they can readily contribute ideas. They see that they are being invited to participate actively in the shaping of a piece of art. This means they have to think and feel, not just in a rehearsal room, but on their own. This isn't just about learning lines, though of course that is like extra homework, but it's about pupils having space in their heads for the work, time to contemplate and reflect between rehearsals. The processes involved in creating a piece of drama at our school are an important part of the education. It is highly collaborative and a creative process for all the pupils involved. Some might do it only once in their school career and others cannot get enough of it and do it constantly. And we cater to both. To start, students engage in a close reading of the text. Each line, each word is interpreted and dissected and the students are encouraged to consider as a group how to best portray the ideas in a visual way. 
imaginative solutions are found to replace potentially expensive props, as you see here with the ship in Gulliver's Travels. The scope of our lighting and sound facilities is thoroughly explored, as you can see here in an image from Antigone, which certainly has a bloody backdrop. And our costumes are carefully considered. We are lucky enough to have an expert costume designer who previously worked in La Scala, the Opera House in Milan. The staging is also considered. Will the play be staged traditionally at the front or as a split stage? Here in the Odyssey, an entire building was used as a stage and the audience hustled from room to room, rather like the movement of refugees as they arrive in a new country. Our large theater can allow for lavish whole stage performances like this. The different approaches develop many skills which are distinct from those learned in traditional academic lessons. Collaboration, creative problem solving, self-discovery and expression, by which I mean the confidence to find different ways of communicating an idea. At our schools, plays have been performed for centuries, even millennia from Shakespeare back to classical Greek productions. And yet they are considered through the modern lens, just in the way you would expect to see in a modern production in a theater in London. Far from students simply learning lines and being directed how to deliver them, they consider as a group, alongside the director or the teacher, how the play is relevant today. In this way, our students have the opportunity to consider the attitudes and mindsets of current society. They are encouraged to think critically and incisively rather than accepting the status quo, as well as develop empathy in their character. The students will use their powers of persuasion and negotiation as they work with the director to produce wonderfully imaginative solutions. The process is an intellectual one and the cast as a whole seeks to provoke the audience into a reaction, to consider issues so they discuss the ideas long after leaving the theater. In order to put on a really professional performance, the rehearsal schedule can be punishing. Students must be well organized and show perseverance and motivation in order to get a great show on the stage, balancing the rehearsals alongside their academic and sports commitments. Of course, performing on stage allows students to develop their confidence in oration, their concentration, their memory skills, their ability to work with others, and all of these are important for success, both personally and professionally in their adult lives after school. On our tour to Germany, the performances at several different theaters involved building and taking down the set at each venue, thinking flexibly and creatively about how to make changes to suit the particular stage the students were acting on, working tightly as a team to make sure the process is as slick as possible when there's time pressure. The language barrier of the audience is taken into consideration and the script is changed between performances in the UK to those in German, often with more emphasis on physical theater to get the point across. They may try to incorporate some humor into the production, thereby often successfully undermining the misconception that a German joke is no laughing matter. Ha ha. Our students will be engaged backstage as well as on stage and they will have an awareness of the financial aspect of the production, as you can see here on the posters of the plays, which they also help to design. What is the budget of the production? How much do we need to charge for tickets? How many people in the audience do we need to cover the cost of production? How will we market the production to ensure that the audience comes? In this sense, students also need to develop their commercial awareness. And finally, in a time when the emotional stress on our students is arguably greater than at any other time in recent history, the performing arts, and by this I mean both music and drama, provide an opportunity to have fun, to focus completely on something other than their daily lives or external worries. And this, of course, is a boost to their mental health and an activity we very much hope that they will carry on in their adult lives for all the health benefits that they receive. Now this slide is a list of top skills required by employers. 
Arguably, every one of them can be fostered and developed through the involvement with performing arts at schools like ours. In fact, my head of drama pointed out that one could argue that drama is the activity that most closely resembles professional working life that our students are likely to encounter. This is because in their working life, they will be working on project-based activities, they'll be collaborating, they'll be working in multi-dimensional areas, they will be problem solving, they will deal with great time pressure, they will have to deliver a performance or a presentation by a deadline, and they will go through these stages that are necessary but different, demanding a range of different skills, higher order critical thinking and emotional intelligence. Our head of drama is adamant that no other activity in the school comes even close to this level of complexity and the range of challenges. So you can see that the pursuit of performing arts within an educational curriculum enables the education of a whole person rather than simply focusing on learning facts and information. This philosophy, which is generally adopted by most top UK schools, is of course at the heart of the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, which is why at Seven Oaks we were one of the early adopters of the IB, more than 40 years ago now, and we continue to promote this outstanding sixth form education. At the heart of the IB is the CAS program, which stands for Creativity, Activity and Service. And this demonstrates the importance placed on the IB on the benefits of creative and performing arts as an integral part of the breadth of any education system. Now I'm going to finish now with a quote from our head of drama here. The theatrical productions in schools are a good thing. Views as to why they are a good thing vary considerably, but there are obvious benefits such as the development of teamwork, confidence, enjoyment, sense of achievement, and physical activity. More than this, they have the potential to offer the most profound, enlightening, and life-enhancing educational experience that a student might encounter in a school. Theater has a unique transformative power that can transcend the moment and lodge in the memory forever. So I hope that you enjoyed that presentation and I hope that you are all persuaded of the importance of performing arts in the education of your sons and daughters. I've attached on this final slide some contact details for us at Seven Oaks School. It's a little bit of a difficult time and we, we don't have visitors on campus as term begins, but we are, we have reopened physically for all of our students and we will be hosting virtual open mornings and arranging virtual tours in the weeks and months ahead. And I hope to meet many of you at some point. Now, I believe I have some time left in my slot, and so we will open it up for questions. And I'll, Wallace, perhaps I'll leave over to you whether to guide me whether or not I should put my slideshow away and just have me on the screen, because I don't think the audience has a, much of a chance to see me yet. Oh, Jesse, thank you. Actually, um... It's not a problem. Please leave your screen on. Uh, all the viewers can see you as you're speaking. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> right, so uh, we'll begin the uh, Q&A session. So we'll have time for a few questions. And uh, I'll try to address all the questions being asked by our attendees. Uh, the first question is, what is the admissions criteria for uh, entry into Seven Oaks? Um, and then a follow-up question for that is, uh, what is the admission process for those that are interested in applying from uh, viewers and children in Hong Kong? Okay, as I said, this is my first week at Seven Oaks, so I'm going, I've, but I've got my director of admissions next to me, so I'm going to hand over to Arabella Stewart, who is going to be able to answer some of these technical questions, but I'm still here for other questions as well. Thank you, Jesse. Hello, everybody. It's, it's nice to meet you. Hi, um, Arabella. Hello. <laughs> Um, so, admissions to Seven Oaks. The criteria for a top school are unusual, um, and the, our first criterion actually involves the character of the child. We're looking very much for children who will be kind and supportive of each other, who will work together well in teams. And so, every student who comes to Seven Oaks takes part in a group interview of six children and two teachers with some collaborative tasks, discussion tasks. And then we actively look out for those students who will listen to each other and include each other. The second criterion, which uh, leads on very neatly from Jesse's presentation, 
is that we're looking for students who will take advantage of the incredible facilities we've got here. So people who will be involved in drama or debating or hockey or service to the community. So we're looking out on their CVs, on their confirmation forms for uh, evidence that the children are involved out of school, that they've developed hobbies and interests. But finally, of course, because we're a fast paced school and, and the lessons go quickly um, and the students are bright and sparky, then we need to test them for their academic ability. So every student who joins us at, at 13 is tested in English and maths, past papers on the website, plus verbal reasoning, and at sixth form in English, maths, and then a general sciences and a general humanities paper. The timings are important. So for applications for sick form, you would need to apply by the 1st of August, just over a year before joining. And for year nine, it's the 1st of October, nearly two years before joining. So there's quite a big lead in, although we don't do pre-testing in year six as some other schools do. So um, perhaps if you're in year six or even at the beginning of year seven and starting to think about year nine entry, that's not too late for seven notes. We do have an entry at, at year seven, but th that's only for day students. So that would really only be for parents who are moving to the UK in time for their children to join at, at year seven. I hope that answers the questions. Uh, I believe it does. Thank you. And, Great, uh, I should hand back over to Jessica. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <coughs> Um, the next follow-up question, uh, and I'm sure Jesse, you or Arabella can answer this as well. Now, Seven Oaks is an IB school, um, and how do uh, applicants and families know if they're, it's more suitable for their children to be in IB or in A levels? And then the second follow-up question for that is, is if people were applying to Seven Oaks and it is an IB school, how is that transition for uh, children that are coming from non-IB schools? Okay, a, a, a very good question. And I know for families thinking about British education, it, it takes a little thought and time to navigate between A-levels and the IB. For me, the key strength of the IB diploma program is the breadth that it offers to the students studying it. So if you, do, if you study the IB, all of the students do six subjects. Now there's still scope within the International Baccalaureate to specialize and because you do three subjects at higher level, so you spend more time studying those and you develop your skills at a higher level and your knowledge. Then you also do three subjects at standard level. But that, it, the, the IB diploma is a diploma. It, it's an all encompassing qualification that involves a lot of independent research. There's an extended essay as part of that. There's a critical thinking philosophical part of the course called theory of knowledge. And you also have to do creative things, as I mentioned, and active things and service. So it's really an all-inclusive, rounded education. Um, A-levels, in contrast, are much more narrow and much more focused. So uh, when you do A-levels at, at the sixth form at a British school, you tend to do just three or four subjects. And so it's a much more narrow curriculum. So I think what might suit a student doing A-levels is, is a student that knows they only want to do maths or sciences, and they're not as interested in the, in the humanities or a language or other creative subjects or that breadth, that kind of breadth of knowledge. Whereas a student that enjoys a, a range of different subjects and wants to be really well-rounded, then the IB suits them very well. I think it's also worth pointing out a little bit from the perspective of university admissions, most, most universities in America, for example, these days, which is a very popular destination, destination, most of those have what's called a liberal arts education, which is much more similar to the IB. If you go to an American university, you have to study a range of different subjects. You probably have to do some maths and science. You also have to do some arts and humanities. And the IB is an excellent preparation for that. It allows you to keep those skills going in all different areas. I know, and I'm sure many of the listeners know, that anybody can become very good at maths. Anybody, but that same person can also learn to speak a language, develop good communication skills, and also write good essays. So it's that breadth of the IB that we really like. Now, in terms of the second part of the question, what's it like coming from another school that's not an IB school to an IB school? For us, we teach IGCSEs and GCSEs in those, in those years 9, 10, and 11 the ages 14 to 16 as pupils are coming into the sixth form. So actually, if, you, if you're doing GCSEs and IGCSEs, those are a really good preparation for the IB. 
because most people will be doing eight, nine, or 10 GCSEs. So again, you already have that breadth and the strength of different subjects. And actually we find a lot of pupils after GCSE, they would have found it very difficult to choose just three A-levels, but it's quite easy to choose six IB subjects and keep many different subjects going. So it should be a relatively seamless transition to an IB school in the sixth form, as long as you've had that breadth of education through years nine, 10, and 11. Thank you, Jesse. And, and just the last question on top of that is, uh, what's the best method for uh, applicants from Hong Kong? Uh, if they if they were uh, for the transition, just because uh, many of the uh, of uh, the studiers here, the, they're transitioning uh, from uh, local schools here, perhaps as well. Yes, and for this, I haven't. I've been to Hong Kong many times, but obviously in my first week, not yet representing Seven Oaks. So I'll no, let no. Um, Mrs. Stewart talk to you about the process to, for applicants from Hong Kong. Thank you. Hello. Um, we, we want our admissions process to be accessible to anybody from any educational background anywhere in the world. So we um, purposely have our own entrance tests, which we believe are very good, um, and processes which are very good uh, at, at getting the right students into the school, whether they come from Hong Kong or anywhere else. So, you know, in my, to my mind, the, the best preparation is for parents to give their, their children a good moral code, to let them uh, spend time with other children, to invest time in supporting their interests and enthusiasms. Of course, they need to be prepared for the entrance tests. You can't just walk into an entrance test and never have, have done any practice before. Um, but I think any good school which teaches English and maths well and does a bit of past paper practice with them just in the run up to the test is going to be absolutely excellent um, educational preparation for Seven Oaks. We do in normal times come to Hong Kong every year in April to do to sort of invigilate tests and do group interviews there in Kowloon. So that makes it easy for people to Hong Kong, for in, in Hong Kong to, to take part in the entrance process. Of course, this year we weren't able to do that, but we very much hope we'll be back next year, fingers crossed. Um, otherwise, it'll be a remote Zoom situation. Um, but yeah, it's completely accessible to people living there. Um, and we do try and come and say hi to everyone once a year. Thank you, Arabella. Uh, and thank you, Jesse. Jesse, I believe uh, we have time for one more question. Um, and this last question it will be more to do with your presentation about performing arts. Now the questions coming in is, is having uh, a background, um, a, a requirement, a uh, background in performance arts, uh, a requirement for entry into Seven Oaks? And then the second question on top of that is, uh, once students do gain entry to Seven Oaks, what kind of special programs are available uh, for uh, children and students at Seven Oaks, and then what age does that start? Okay, a, a good question. I would say, in general, at Seven Oaks, there's no requirement for in expertise or um, real interest or experience in any of the co-curricular things that we offer. So, if if you come here in year nine and you want to become a tennis player, we can start from scratch and support you in becoming a tennis player. And if you're already a very good tennis player, an elite tennis player, we've had a number of players here with national rankings who've gone on to university on scholarships to play tennis. We can cater for that really high level as well. And then of course we have dozens of pupils in, be in between playing tennis. And the same goes for music. And of course the same goes for drama or performing arts. If you've never been on the stage, if you've never acted, that's okay. You can come here and we will get you involved possibly in smaller roles and help build up your confidence and experience, but you could still be in a lead role or starring in a school production and your time here. And again, that, that's, that's, the same, that's the same for music. You may be very, very good. And I'm, I've met some fantastic musicians from Hong Kong, um, but you may come here and decide actually you want to learn an instrument and we can cater for that as well. And whatever level you are, if it's grade three or four or a diploma, or I've, we've taught students who are going off to international competitions. So um, our co-curricular life here is a really important aspect of the school. It's obviously something that the British education system is very famous for and prides itself. And we have 110 acres here, um, gorgeous facilities, multiple spaces for the performing arts, and um, we can cater to the highest level, but also we welcome novices and beginners. I hope that answers all of that. 
Uh, perfect. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, and I believe that's uh, all the time we have uh, with you for today. So before I let you go, um, do you have any parting words for all of our attendees today? Um, yes, you put me on the spot, Wallace, but I, I've got some parting <laughs> words. I think what I would say to all the attendees, and I know we've got over 250 families listening right now, is as we just recognize this is a really difficult time. In this global pandemic, in some ways, I think that it's brought the world together and that we've all faced the same challenges um, and, and the same virus in our, in our personal lives and it's affected our professional lives. And unfortunately, very sadly, it's affected the education of the children. Um, here, at, here at Seven Oaks, we've been fortunate in that we've been able to keep the education of the children going remotely. And so we've been teaching pupils online and keeping, it, keeping them, keeping, ensuring that they're all making good progress. But we all, um, we all look forward to the world returning to normality. And I'm delighted that we've had hundreds of boarders, including boarders from Hong Kong and China, who've made it back for the start of term here in the UK. And we're, um, we're, we haven't done everything perfectly here in the UK. I've, um, the government could have done better at points, but we're managing the infection quite well now. And I'm very confident and hopeful that um, this, we're gonna have a great school year and that things will return to normal. So my real parting words are hang in there we're all going to get through this pandemic, and uh, we look forward to meeting many of you in person on the other side. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and we really appreciate your time. Uh, best of luck to you as you begin the, the, your school year at uh, Seven Notes as well. Uh, so going forward, uh, just to uh, reiterate to all of our guests, if you have any questions about the admissions process of Seven Oaks, you can uh, connect on to their website through the webpage that you use to register for this festival. So going forward, uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Jennifer Ma of Arch Education. Now I'm just going to do a, a brief uh, biography of Jennifer before I uh, hand over the microphone to her. So Jennifer Ma is the co-founder and director of Arch Education. Jennifer attended top schools, uh, including St. Paul's Coeducational College here in Hong Kong and Benenden School in the UK. Before graduating from the University of Oxford with first class honors in economics and management, Jennifer achieved her master's in education at the University of Hong Kong and is the co-author of the bestseller Boarding Schools, All You Need to Know. Jennifer is a Benenden School Trustee, China Oxford Scholarship Fund Panelist, and is part of the University of Oxford Pembroke College also in circle. At Arch, Jennifer is responsible for the development of enrichment programs. She leads the UK and HA consultation teams, which specializes in applications for Oxbridge and professional subjects including medicine, law, and architecture. Without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Wallace. Um, thank you to all the parents and students for joining us today. And thank you to Wickham Abbey Hong Kong um, for inviting me to be a panelist today. Um, uh, Arch Education is the only organization today that is not a boarding school. We are an independent education institute in Hong Kong that prepares students uh, who are interested in applying to UK, US boarding schools. So over the past 11 years, we've had thousands of successful cases helping students apply to schools abroad. And I'm very, very excited today to share on this topic, preparation for UK boarding schools, assessment requirements and key considerations. So without further ado, um, this is, uh, let me see. Oh, hold on one second. Okay, so, um, 
Today's agenda is as follows. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction of Arch so you understand where, what kind of experience uh, we have and uh, why top UK boarding schools. I would be referencing the very top UK board boarding schools in terms of the assessment requirements. Because once you are able to understand how the top boarding schools um, recruit, then the same mentality applies to all the boarding schools in the UK. Um, I'll talk about the latest insights of trends, including timeline changes, multi-layers of testing, diversity of assessment coverage, interview questions, and progression pathways that you should take into account whilst preparing. At the very end, I will also recap by summarizing the six-step preparation process we go through with our students, or if your parents would like to do so independently. Um, Arch, uh, our mission is to bridge the education gaps, and we do six things. Uh, first of all, skills enrichment for students aged 7 to 14 in critical thinking, speaking, reading, writing programs. As mentioned earlier, we prepare a lot of students applying for overseas boarding schools or universities, postgraduates. Um, we provide all academic preparation support for all international curriculums. We are also the only education institution that is independent in Asia that is approved by a university. So we are the teaching institution of University of London. What that means is all the results we we um, publicly share have to be 100% accurate. Um, we help our alumni students land their first job or internship through our careers network. And we also run lots of nationwide signature programs through our nonprofit arm. Today, we are focusing on boarding schools um, admissions assessments. So myself, um, I went through boarding school, um, as Wallace mentioned, UK boarding, then UK uni. My brother actually went through prep school in the UK at the age of 10 before going on to um, in Winchester. My partner went through the US route, went to Choate. So we, we come with a wealth of personal experience and um, expertise um, in applying for overseas. Over the years, over the past 11 years, we've had amazing track record, um, both of boarding schools and universities. This year alone, we got 93% of our students into the most selective 11 boarding schools, with 85% of them getting unconditional offers or scholarships. Um, our students come from all walks of life and they go through different education pathways and that makes our job more challenging but also interesting because we need to help students bridge the gaps in preparation. So they can be from local school directly to overseas uh, boarding, uh, universities, international schools to overseas universities, or they can be transitioning from local to international. Um, pathways four and five is basically going through boarding schools and then staying in the same region for universities. Pathway six and seven means they go to boarding schools and then to different region for university. So preparation uh, um, to bridge a gap is absolutely key. Um, our source of insights for boarding schools um, uh, is because we have had a lot of experience walking through students through their profiles from a macro viewpoint. Um, oftentimes students come in um, at all at different ages as young as six, seven, and as um, uh, older at maybe even 16, 17, looking for um, different education pathways. So what are the midterm and long-term considerations and how to map their plan out? Uh, we have a few senior consultants themselves, former headmasters of schools in the UK, going around schools for annual visits. Um, we actually help with preparation and not just processing. Uh, we are um, objective in our recommendations. We are not agencies, which means we don't take commission from schools. So all our recommendations are very objective, tailored to each student. And most importantly, we have a lot of students who will help with university applications, and they're currently actually boarding school students. So they often give us first-hand insights on what boarding schools are like. So why top UK boarding schools? Many parents ask, you know, should I just go to any school so I can just complete my GCSEs and A-levels? Or should I really strive to go for the more competitive schools where I need to go through the many rounds of assessments and evaluations? Well, um, there are merits for going to top boarding schools. And for this um, iFestival, I also see many of the top boarding schools are being featured, um, mainly for a few reasons. One is the academic diversity and depth. Um, the better the boarding school, the more resources they have, and the more subjects they're able to provide. Um, for example, you know, economics, they may be able to provide that subject in business studies at GCSE level. Some schools uh, for IB even provide diverse subject choice, let's say anthropology, um, uh, astronomy. So the more options they provide students, um, the, the more um, um, uh, exposure they may have in identifying their interest and passion and their strengths. 
Um, in terms of depth, a lot of these top boarding schools would run competitions. They would encourage students to go for um, um, uh, national competitions and they would have the resources to support them in preparing for these competitions. Um, Facilities, um, needless to say, um, a more top boarding school would perhaps have more resources. For example, this uh, picture on the right, um, top right, actually is uh, my school, Ben and Den, um, that actually has a state-of-the-art science block um, built a few years ago. And then, as you can see from the picture below, um, some of these boarding schools have really upgraded their pastoral care and their um, house uh, facilities. Um, looks pretty much like uh, a hotel. And so um, it really takes care of students' well-being as well. Um, in terms of next step um, options and pathways, um, top boarding schools also are able to cater students to applying to global um, education routes and universities. Um, globalization, many of them now are establishing exchange programs and you know, letting students uh, do flipboard learning with schools from different countries to, to, put, to expose them to different regions and different people from different cultures. 21st century mentality, um, a lot of times, even with maybe Hong Kong, always talks about you know, grit, resilience in uh, students. And um, Goddenston in this picture is one of those schools that actually has a yacht, which every single student um, over their uh, education journey will have to take this boat out and survive on this boat. So the more top the schools, um, it is true that the assessment process will be more cumbersome, will be more selective, but uh, it is still worth to, to, to aim high because these schools will provide um, a provision that is unparalleled. So now boarding school admissions, um, latest insights of trends. So referencing some of these more selective schools, they are all different in terms of uh, gender mix, um, size, environment, history. Um, the curriculum could be different. As mentioned earlier, some schools offer only IB, some schools offer a mix of IB, A-level, pre-U. Um, the university destination may be different. Some schools are predominantly UK, some are more international, aiming for other regions as well. However, when it comes to admissions, um, they also differ uh, hugely. Um, number of places could differ. Some schools are highly selective. They only take in a few students a year from Hong Kong. Some take in a, a bit more. Um, some take in at different age, age groups. Um, the selectiveness is also different. Um, uh, their selection criteria will be different, and I'll talk more about that later. And therefore, the types of assessments are also different. Um, the most confusing part, however, for parents is a time frame for registration and a timeline of examination taking place because each school has their own um, um, examination timetable that uh, we have had students applying for, let's say, all boys, or all, well, all girls in particular, boarding schools where they had to fly abroad to do weekend interviews, end up flying four times in five months to address, um, to, to attend to all these interviews. So it's really important that parents do research, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. So timeline requirements differ by school, just to give you a snapshot, just taking a few all boys schools as reference, Eton, Harrow, Tunbridge, Westminster, Winchester, these are all all boys schools. And they have different types of exams, different uh, uh, stages of examinations from pre isep to school pretest, to interview, to common entrance or proprietary um, uh, examinations. Um, they also uh, have different requirements and different times. Harrow and Tunbridge uh, use um, agencies and the other schools do not. So at the age of 10, uh, they might already have to start write, uh, writing these papers uh, for the 13 plus entry. So a few years ahead in terms of preparation is important. As you can see, um, uh, the student as an example who was applying for this year, um, uh, whilst his uh, um, uh, entry point is 2020, his preparation in terms of examinations actually predates uh, three years. So he started his own pre-test in 2017 and doing all the other examinations, interviews, etc. in the following years. And if you're applying to other schools as well, such as Seven Oaks, Aundo, this one's not all boys, then the uh, timeline becomes even more uh, complex. Multi-layers of testing. Um, as we know in Hong Kong, local school education uh, pretty much looks like this. Um, students look towards the teachers for instructions and therefore for Asian students, we are very much focused on grades. Grades is, is the determinant factor. However, in ov uh, overseas UK boarding school, even US boarding school education um, is very much about discussion-based learning. So this is what we would call in the UK boarding school a U-shaped table where students sit together and they discuss a topic. What that means is schools uh, look at 
a lot of other factors beyond grades, both schools and universities. So beyond grades, they look at additional standardized test scores. As I mentioned earlier, the pre-ICEPs, those are all different types of test scores. Um, you can set all these um, terminologies parents would have heard of. These are all standardized tests. Um, they may ask for essays, students to write their own personal statement to state why they want to go for this particular school, teacher recommendations, extracurricular activity profile, and ultimately interviews, whether the student is able to present and communicate their interests um, in um, a, a verbal setting. So um, usually the order of uh, assessments are as follows. They would ask for your school transcripts and recommendations. Um, sometimes this is slightly of a lower priority for some of the top schools because they understand that some of the Hong Kong schools may not be as comprehensive in putting together the transcripts. So they would look more towards their profile, individual students' profile. Um, they would look at their computerized tests, let's say the ISAT pretest, UCASET, um, CAT4, etc. Uh, personal statement questionnaires, um, usually written by students, um, interviews. Um, and these are quite varied in formats, and I'll talk more about that later, and uh, ultimately conditional offers. Some conditional offers, um, they require papers to be done, and these are school proprietary papers. Some of these are really for screening, so if you do not pass it, they actually will not extend you the real offer. But some of these conditional offers um, uh, are there so that they can see your ability uh, for setting. Diversity of assessments, um, in general, the assessments co uh, cover English, which has two parts, comprehension and composition, uh, math, uh, reasoning, verbal and nonverbal. Um, depending on school and age, some schools may require sciences and occasional, uh, uh, some schools would require linguistics, history, RS, general paper. But depending on how selective the school is, um, the more demanding they may be with the requirements on exams. But most of the standardized tests, let's say UCASET or um, ISAT pretest, they would be focused on the first uh, three points, English, math, and reasoning. So what are the main challenges for Hong Kong students? Over the years, we've helped many students prepare for these examinations. And uh, here are the key, few key gaps. For English in particular, will be the skills gaps. So for example, um, uh, comprehension. A lot of schools in Hong Kong, especially local schools, may not do as much comprehension. They do a lot of grammar, vocabulary, drilling. But when it comes to comprehension, answering open-ended questions, reading unseen texts, they may not be as uh, familiar with it. Exam techniques, um, you know, a lot of these exams have marks and marking schemes. So are they able to really score all the points? That's down to exam techniques. Exposure, composition, for example, at a very young age for the UK, more selective schools, they already expect students to do both creative and analytical writing. So some children in Hong Kong may be more uh, more prone to creative writing and haven't done as much analytical writing. In that respect, we'll need to give them some exposure and bridge that gap. Uh, maths, uh, most Hong Kong students are quite well versed in mathematics in terms of ability, but uh, when they write the paper for UK boarding school, they're all in English. So are they as familiar with the English terminologies? Curriculum gaps, sometimes students are just not covering that particular um, area of maths in their current curriculum. It's not, nothing to re, uh, not reflective of their ability, it's just that they haven't done it in their own school. So uh, understanding the key stage, the UK system is quite important as, and as you know, Howard mentioned just now about the Wickham Abbey curriculum, if you're in that system, you're running, you're already doing the UK um, curriculum, so there wouldn't be that curriculum gap. But if you're in Hong Kong, attending regular local, even international schools, that could very well be the curriculum gap in maths. Um, reasoning, um, I will show you some questions later, but most students in Hong Kong would not have seen these uh, 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 questions. So actually giving them some exposure is key um, to ensuring that they actually understand what they're supposed to do with these um, questions. Um, for sciences, uh, many schools in Hong Kong actually don't do sciences until uh, they're 10 or 11. Uh, um, and even they do do sciences, it's integrated with other subjects. Um, but in the UK curriculum, uh, in key stage, science is actually quite a prominent area. So um, there's sometimes some curriculum gap if science is required in a, as an exam. Same thing for the other subjects. 
So the verbal reasoning, as I mentioned, uh, I'll show you some questions, and this is just an example. Um, and it's all really about word patterns. It's really about vocabulary, about relationships between words, a bit of grammar. So it's a way that is asked that could differ. And some schools actually have their own verbal reasoning tests, and their focus of question types or emphasis may also differ. So, um, this is nonverbal, very much about spatial awareness. It does test your um, quantitative ability via spatial awareness is quite related to like your maths and science ability down the line. Um, and so, in fact, this kind of paper is not just for boarding schools. Um, as, as old as going into universities, some subjects like medicine that require um, this kind of aptitude would also use word nonverbal as, uh, as a test. Um, so for these tests, students can improve uh, with preparation because the more familiar they are with it, uh, if, they are, if they are aware of what kind of techniques they can apply, they can improve. But ultimately, these tests are not supposed to be prepared um, or um, uh, just simply because this is an aptitude test and there is a natural ceiling for each candidate. But some preparation is good for them to familiarize uh, to these question types. For us at Arch, we also do a lot of analysis of different examinations across different schools. Different schools' proprietary papers may entail a slightly different syllabus and exam focus. So depending on how students are going for which schools, then it's also important that they understand uh, the requirements per school. Some schools are quite open. They provide you the syllabus. Um, they give you, um, 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 you know, sample examination papers on, on, on the website, such as Seven Oaks, as mentioned earlier by Arabella. And that's very, very helpful of the school, but not all schools do that. So um, it's important to, um, to get as much uh, information from track uh, record performance of our other students to share with current cohorts. Interviews. So a lot of uh, parents are very concerned about interviews because um, you just never know how the child will, will perform on the day and what kind of interviews, uh, questions they may, they may come across. And sometimes the interview setting could be different as well, which could also throw students off. Um, so for example, um, a lot of the girls' schools in particular and a few uh, board, uh, boys' schools and some other uh, boarding schools uh, would prefer to invite students over to the UK to be interviewed. Um, um, and uh, but of course, a lot of schools also interview in Hong Kong, many of them through agents. Um, so the format is very different because if you go abroad for interviews, um, either you go to, well, you are in a different setting and, um, and you need to acclimatize to, uh, environment, to the environment, to the weather, etc. But at the same time, many of these interviews take the form of weekend interviews, which means students need to immerse into group activities or group interviews, which is very different from the one-on-one -on -one interviews um, that take place in Hong Kong through agencies or expo fairs. Um, each would have their uh, uh, slightly difficult uh, situations to navigate because if you're in a school setting, you have a much longer time, much more activities to be evaluated on. So the students should really, of course, enjoy themselves, but at the same time, has a longer time uh, they will need to perform. Um, if you're in Hong Kong and you're going through these um, expo you know, uh, interviews, then you really only have like 10 to 20 minutes um, to showcase yourself and and the whole environment may be a little bit rushed. So it's one candidate after the other candidate. So um, it's even more important that you need to be immediately memorable for the right reasons. So um, different skills required for different environments. Um, usually in terms of interview question types, uh, if this sharing is two hours, I can share more about interview questions, but just as a summary, um, there are lots of different types of interview questions we have come across. Personal standard questions like, you know, why UK boarding school? Why should we pick you? Or what, what are your hobbies? To debate over controversial topics. So for example, you know, um, um, uh, do you think Trump should win the next presidential election? Or, um, uh, you know, should is, is inequality something that we can uh, solve or should we solve it so oftentimes students answer a response and then they get a question on the contrary um, of the response so they really have to debate uh, their own points and also debate uh, with the interviewer. Um, impromptu literature, um, some schools like to take out poems or um, maybe an extract from a book uh, or, and get the student to read it and then sh immediately share their thoughts about um, that particular piece of um, assessments. Um, 
uh, extract. Um, so with that then, you know, it's really about students' ability to think impromptu, to reference their own um, academic knowledge and ability and skills to apply in person when they are probably a little bit more uh, pressurized under the interview scenario. Um, alternative questions such as, um, you know, bring a few objects in from home and share with me uh, why those objects are so, such a highlight for you or um, abstract questions um, such as, you know, if you could invite um, a, a few people to dinner and uh, some are uh, dead or alive, who may, who may you wish to invite? So all that is really just a teaser to get the students to share something that may be related to their own interests and also to see if a student is able to address an abstract question, but also at the same time, um, highlighting their own personality and attributes. Um, current affairs, as I mentioned earlier, you know, increasingly linked to international relations. I had a candidate last year who is um, aged 10, 11, and was actually asked about global current affairs. It's actually really interesting how um, children nowadays are much more exposed to these topics, and therefore interviews are also picking up on these questions. Um, and at the same time, of obviously brain, uh, brain teasers, um, uh, no right, no right or wrong answers, it just depends on how you tackle them. And at the same time, really bringing out the students' presentation skills and also personality. Just to give you an example, uh, I'm not sure whether this is a brain teaser question or just uh, an alternative uh, question, but one of our students who went for a selective girls' school got presented this painting and asked, well, what is this painting trying to tell you? So the student has to you know, explain the different features and probably uh, share her own thoughts. And then um, the follow-up question would be, you know, if you were to name this painting, what would it be and why? So it's really just a conversation, nothing to be scared of, but at the same time is to see if a student is able to embrace that unforeseen um, uh, question and situation. And it's very relevant because when you go to school, ultimately you are in a, in a, in a group of um, um, students and engaged in discussion-based learning. So the more you're able to embrace discussion, uh, the better for the student immersing into the new school. So lastly, six-step preparation. So whether it's at, with us at Arch or parents can do so independently, every year we bring on uh, maximum capacity of 40 students. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, we had uh, really stellar results the past year. Um, so six steps, first of all, we always meet every single one of our students because their aspiration could be very different, which means the type of schools they want to go for will be different. And, um, and uh, you know, whether they should even go to boarding school is also a question. So what's the student's uh, long-term goal? Is their current school the right curriculum? Um, any particular area or profession that they'd like to pursue? So for example, if a student says, I really want to go for medicine and that's it, then you know, whether they go for stay in Hong Kong school and they'll go directly to Hong Kong universities or whether they want to open options abroad, is IB a better curriculum or A-levels? So all these questions are very important to identify what schools are right for them and, um, and, uh, and then set out the preparation timeline. So if they're going for various different schools and you know, setting out the timeline, it's getting a bit more complex. More schools are moving assessments earlier and also changing assessments. So the second thing we do is come up with a timeline individually for each student. Then, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these examinations are not really content heavy. They're very much skill-based. So whether it's like you know, interviews through speaking programs or our Socrates program to get them to think about current affair issues and verbalize their thoughts in a small group setting, which really uh, assimilates um, the boarding school way of learning. Um, uh, uh, we will also think about that. So I think a lot of parents in Hong Kong like to do one-on-one -on -one, and I understand the effectiveness of that. But actually, if you are thinking about immersing them uh, and preparing them up to go to schools abroad to study, small group environment is actually much more favorable um, to their development. Then um, a lot of different tutors for us to, to, to tutor across all the different subjects, especially for the sixth form entry. If you're going for a sixth form entry at the age of 16, 17, actually students will, will pick their own subjects for A-levels and they will have different subject examinations. So actually ensuring that they can do those subjects is very important for the exams, um, pre-application pre, uh, um, exams. Uh, we have our own mock papers to monitor their progress. Um, to make sure that they are uh, uh, at the right level for the particular school they are applying for and different schools will have different standards. Uh, bolstering up their academic interest and profile. These are just some of the projects we work with our students. Uh, the one at the bottom is really interesting. This is at age 12 
boy who is very, very talented in maths, but lost, tr lost interest in maths because she, he didn't see the relevance of, of, of his maths interest at school, etc. So we actually did a superhero uh, series with him and used math to prove or disprove the, um, the, the authenticity, uh, authenticity of these superheroes' um, um, actions. So, you know, I think this kind of thing really um, makes the student interesting and something for them to talk about in interviews and beyond. So um, to recap then today, we went through a little bit about what we do at Arch, um, why uh, parents are encouraged to aim high and go for some of these more selective top boarding schools, which would naturally entail um, more examinations and assessments. Um, and we talked about the latest insights and trends, what has changed and what are um, increasingly more um, uh, competitive uh, to, to, for, for these top schools. And at the end, you know, what are the key six step preparation uh, for parents whether they want to you know get extra help or um, uh, be aware uh, independently to ensure no gap is missed in the um, preparation for these top schools thank you thank you Jennifer for your presentation um, and providing all these resources and materials for our attendees uh, so we're, we're getting close to the uh, the end of this session. So uh, before uh, I let you go, I would like to ask just one question. Now, if parents are interested uh, in uh, Arch Education Youth Services, uh, when's the best time for them to approach you if they're interested in applying for UK boarding schools? Um, actually, we have children coming quite young, but it really depends on what age they want to go. If they want to go at age 13 and they're a boy and they want to aim for all boys schools and testing actually starts at age 10, then preparation of course should start at age eight or nine. But they're thinking, if they're thinking of going to boarding school at the age of 16, then they don't need to start so early. So it really depends on case by case basis. So we meet all our parents to establish that timeline. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Um, and, and just the last thing uh, before I let you go, do you have any uh, parting words for our attendees today? Um, I would say, you know, be open-minded. Um, there are so many options out there, so many different curriculums, so many different schools. And I really do um, agree with the comment that was made by a previous speaker that you, if you can, do visit the school uh, because you can smell the school. And there's a lot of qualitative elements that any no consultants can really uh, explain and it's very personal so um, do visit the schools if you can and meet the people meet the heads etc thank you uh, Jennifer thank you so very much for your time and all your expertise um, I can see from the comments at the bottom you're, you're stimulating a lot of conversation and questions unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> We've run out of time, um, but uh, you can see answer the Arch Education. I'll just answer them live. I'll type in the answers. Thank you. You can see the Arch Education number there, um, everybody. And also Jennifer has is, is just said she'll be good enough to stay online and uh, get into the typing. Um, yep. So Jennifer, thank you very much. And thank you to Arch uh, for your support this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, we move on now to our, to our next um, school, and we're delighted to be joined by... Uh, two colleagues from Rugby School uh, who are going to be presenting together, uh, Sally Rosa and uh, Lisa Greatwood. So you're, you're both very welcome. We, we had a chat yesterday, but it's good to see you um, as we go. And um, we've, we've got loads and loads of people I can see at the bottom of my screen uh, poised to listen to your words. So uh, <laughs> you're very welcome. Sally Rosa is a deputy head pastoral at Rugby School and has been a house mistress the four girls boarding houses over her teaching career. Sally joined rugby uh, the year the school became fully co-educational and has seen her four children go through as pupils at the school. Her main responsibilities include working closely with the house masters and house mistresses and working closely with the counseling and medical teams and with the head of BSH EE. Lisa Lisa Greatwood is assistant to the deputy head pastoral, who is Sally, and join Sally uh, for this presentation. Lisa teaches philosoph philosophy, theology, biology, RS, I think you put in when we spoke yesterday, uh, and, and PSHEE. Lisa is also the assistant chaplain um, at rugby school. Lisa has served for a significant time at rugby school and prior to that was a long serving member of the teaching staff at Stowe School, another one of the great British boarding schools. You're both very welcome, and we look forward to all you have to share with us on your topic, which is well-being, 
in a student's journey through senior school. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Howard. And it's really good to be here this morning. Um, I will get my screen. Hopefully people can see that. So good That's morning, everybody. Um, is that all right, Howard? Can you see the yes. screen? Perfect. Well done. Brilliant. That's the first step then to the well-being from our perspective. I'm going, I'm going to leave you to it now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as Howard said, I'm Sally Rosser. I'm going to begin the presentation this morning really just by taking you through um, some of the specifics about how um, we at Rugby School are set up to look after your children and to um, work with you and them to make sure that their well-being is all that it can be. We know that happy children make the best learners and from the academic perspective um, everything that we do is um, geared to making them um, be the best that they can be and achieve the best that they can achieve. So I'm going to start as I say by taking you through a little bit about rugby school and then Lisa is going to speak specifically about that well-being journey. So Rugby School is located um, in a West Midlands market town, um, very well situated right in the centre of England for international airports, about 50 minutes on the train from London, um, very good accessibility to Heathrow Airport, Gatwick Airport and Birmingham Airport. The school was established like many um, big independent school many, many years ago, 1567, um, Lawrence Sheriff um, died and on his bequest, established a school for local boys. Um, in the 19th century, the school moved from the centre of town um, onto the Lord of the Manor's site. The school has grown up on the um, south side and this, the town has grown up around us. Um, we first took our sixth form girls in the 1970s and in 1993, we became fully co-educational. So we have been um, doing, if you like, co-education with boys and girls for a long time now. So we currently have 840 pupils on roll uh, with an equal split between boys and girls. And even with coronavirus and all the difficulties that that has caused, we are expecting around 830 pupils to actually be here in school next week and the other 10 or so to be joining us in the next few weeks as flights allow. 640 of them are full boarders and we absolutely pride ourselves here at Rugby School on being a full boarding school. Um, I would advise you as parents when you are looking at full boarding schools, particularly um, from the international perspective, to really make sure that the schools that you are looking at are full boarding. All of our boys and girls are here seven days a week if they are boarders. Um, we have a full programme of lessons on a Saturday morning with um, sports activities in the afternoon, a social programme in the evening. Um, we have chapel for the whole school on Sunday and nobody goes home except the 200 day pupils that we also have. So the day pupils come in for seven days a week, but they don't sleep here. 18% of our cohort are international students and they come from literally all parts of the world. Just out of interest, we have um, a house at the moment that's set up. Term doesn't actually begin here until tomorrow, but we have um, 57 international students who have been here quarantining with us um, for the last couple of weeks. And it's been an absolute joy to be working with them. Um, I will talk a little bit about our house setup, absolutely integral to um, supporting every young person here at Rugby School, absolutely integral to their well-being. Um, the houses are small units, about 50 children per house, with 10 in each year group. So when you do visit um, a boarding school or you're doing your research, do look at what the structure is like in the boarding houses. Here at Rugby, um, 10 children in each year group. Each house has um, each year group from 13 to 18 year olds. And we think that is a really good mix and a healthy way to be. Around 140 pupils join us in year nine at 13 plus. Um, with a cohort also joining us in year 12 into the sixth form. And we're very excited that in 2021, we will be introducing the International Baccalaureate. Alongside A-levels. Alongside A-levels, thank you, Lisa. Um, this is why we're presenting together. <laughs> 
Um, so we have 15 houses here at Rugby School. Um, we have eight girls' houses and seven boys' houses. The reason we have eight girls' houses is because we have a specifically sixth form girls' house. We still find that an awful lot of girls are wanting to join us for the sixth form. They may have been at girls' day schools here in the UK, um, or they may have been at girls' boarding schools and want to come for a co-educational sixth form. Each of the boarding houses has three resident staff. There's a house master or a house mistress. Um, there's, they are well supported by a matron. The matron looks after the domestic running of the house and the health and welfare of the boys and girls. Um, and there's also a deputy house master or house mistress living in the house too. They get to know the children particularly well. Um, on top of that, we have a team of tutors attached to each boarding house and the day houses, but each boarding house. Um, every member of staff, apart from the headmaster, is a tutor in a boarding house. And as a tutor, um, I will get to know my tutor group really, really well. And we feel it's very, very important that every boy and girl, whether they're at rugby school or any school, um, is known and really well known by at least one person. Um, Inevitably, they'll be really well known by many more, but the tutor is that person who does get to know their tutees really, really well. So the houses, as I've mentioned, are set up really as family units. What you can see here is a photograph of a lunch in a girl's boarding house. Um, lunch is a more formal affair. Um, everybody is in uniform. You can see that there are some adults eating with the, um, with the house. The resident house staff eat three meals a day with their houses, so they will have breakfast, they will have lunch and they will have supper with their boarding house. And again, it really means that they are getting to, to see these young people, they're getting to know them as they walk into the dining room, they can see what their mood is like, um, they can watch what they're eating, they can see whether they've had a good night's sleep, um, they can just sit and have informal chats. Lunch is a more formal affair, um, as members of staff we go round to the houses um, and we'll eat with the boys and girls as well. Breakfast and supper are much more informal affairs. All of the laundry is also done in the boarding houses. So it really is like a home from home. By, by the laundry ladies. By the laundry ladies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the houses have a real sense of community. And as, as we heard Jennifer saying at the end of her presentation earlier, you know, when you visit any of our schools, you know, you will really get a feel as soon as you walk in, this is Bradley House, as soon as you walk through the door at Bradley House, you'll get a real sense of what Bradley House is like. And that's very, very important um, for you as parents. Um, this is not my quote here. This is from the Good Schools Guide recently. Um, and this is Kilbracken House, one of the boys' houses having fun in the garden. But I, I hope you would find, if you came to rugby, that there really is a sense of community, that pupils are welcoming. They are very, very used to having adults um, around them. It is true to say that when the, the, the young people first come at 13, it takes them a little bit of time to get used to us, putting them to bed, um, always being with them, asking them how they are. Um, but they very soon get familiar with that. And I think you as parents, when you come, um, would be invited to come and have lunch in one of our boarding houses to come and meet the young people um, and I hope you would be saying what the Good School Guide is also saying. Um, settling in, so our um, term as I say begins tomorrow so our um, new um, children at 13 plus and our new sixth form will be coming. Um, but for the 13 plus children we have a, a full week this week of induction um, where they are introduced to the teachers who are going to teach them, to the tutors who are going to be working with them. They will meet their year group or have met their year group already in June um, this year. Um, really strangely and it is really strange because Lisa <laughs> and I are both people, pe people persons. Um, this year we had a virtual new pupil day, um, but just like we are doing here, we're able to introduce them to each other. So they've already got to know each other a little bit um, from June. As parents, we feel it's really important that you get to know as quickly as possible um, the parents of the other children that your young people will be living with. Um, we have an activities weekend specifically for the 13 plus children, and that's in uh, four weeks time um, where they will be um, living together as a year group for a weekend. Normally we'd be taking them off site this year we'll be doing it here at school but they'll be completely off timetable and that weekend will be spent 
um, for them getting to know each other really, really well and building relationships with each other. Lisa is going to talk a little bit more about the importance that we place on developing those positive and healthy relationships. Um, in addition to the um, house teams that we have, um, as Howard said at the beginning, I work very, very closely with our medical team and our counselling team. Um, the physical health of the children is clearly vitally important and our medical centre with a, a fully staffed team of um, five fabulous nurses um, will look after the physical health of the, the, the children with us. Each boarding house and the day houses, but each boarding house has its own named nurse who gets to know the 50 children in that boarding house really, really well and can be another go-to person for them. On top of that, we have a team of five um, counsellors who are offering that additional support should it be necessary. Um, the team call themselves the Time to Talk team and it's exactly that. They're fully integrated in the school. There is no stigma around going to see a counsellor because it literally gives um, the young people with us that time to talk about anything that might be worrying them. Um, I'm going to hand over to Lisa in a moment, but again, this is not what we say about ourselves, but the Good Schools Guide say that we have put an enormous amount of effort into our pastoral care. And we would hope that um, if we are lucky enough to have you visit us at any point, um, that you will say the same too. So I'm going to hand over to Lisa and I will come back at the end of the presentation. Um, so in terms of um, relationships, we know that actually one of the key things in, in ensuring that people have good well-being is how connected they feel to other people and therefore it's right at the centre of everything that rugby um, does is that actually the relationships um, we, we actually explicitly teach about how to, um, to, um, to be, have good relationships and about conflict. Um, and particularly relationships with peers, but also with, um, with staff. So um, I think you can have the next one. Yes. So here we've, here we've got a lesson. Um, the staff are all trained. Um, we have highly enhanced kind of safeguarding. We have lots of inset for staff. And as the staff are in with the, the um, pupils uh, in houses so much, actually the, the, the quality of the relationship that develops is really, really special. Um, and the, our idea is that actually every child should have a network of people that they're able to talk to. Um, we recognise that actually they will want to talk to, uh, they will pick who they want to talk to. But our philosophy is to make sure that there are plenty of people. So housemaster, deputy housemaster, tutor, matron, counsellors, peer listeners. We have um, the older pupils are trained in how to, um, have a, how to listen well and how to help. They might have buddies in house, they have family groups in house. So it's, it's a massive part of our ethos. Um, that actually the pupils feel supported and have people that they can talk to. Um, so much so that actually this is our this is our our, sort of our, our strap line, if you like. The whole person is the whole point. Um, uh, this is what uh, Tatler School Guide has said. Um, we and I'm going to go through some of the things that um, we have on offer. And many schools will have similar um, activities. So if you're visiting schools, do ask them what kind of things they're putting on. Um, because actually that will give you a good idea of, of how ev every individual, how they can actually um, enhance and kind of stretch and challenge themselves in lots of different areas. So our philosophy is to try to stretch and challenge in a really supportive environment so that actually the pupils and students actually discover that they are, that they are so much better than they think they are in many things. Now, obviously, rugby school is well known for being the, um, the place where rugby football was invented. And so obviously, um, rugby is very important. Um, uh, and uh, the, 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 the boys will be in introduced to rugby football if they haven't played it. People who haven't played it before find that actually they, they really enjoy it. They're really looking forward to coming back and actually um, sort of doing some, some rugby training um, with COVID kind of restrictions. Um, but rugby is not the only thing that we offer. We have a huge number of different sports. So we have hockey, boys hockey, girls hockey, sailing, fencing, okay, pigeon shooting, um, athletics, cricket, um, loads of them. Um, with um, the other things that we have, because we know that, well, with, with sport, um, we know that actually exercise really helps to um, improve stress relief and those sort of things. So actually all pupils will participate in sport, um, but as they get through the school, they get to choose which ones they want to specialise in. 
music. Uh, this is our, our TSR, uh, this is the orchestra playing, um, lots of different um, places that people can do music, recognizing that actually, you know, music is a brilliant outlet for, for stress and the kind of link between well-being and music is very, very well known. Um, all pupils will actually participate in a house singing, um, which they love. It's the sing-off, we call it, um, which is really, they really, really enjoy that. Um, other activities that kind of help to enhance and bring out people's kind of um, passions, drama. Um, we have a very full programme of, of drama that goes on with uh, two major plays. Uh, we've got a house play event, which anybody can, can attend kind of imp improvisation groups, um, lambda exams. Um, again, kind of in exposing pupils to, to things that they might not have done before and that actually they might really enjoy and discover that they've got aptitudes in. Um, as well as that, we have what we call enrichment. Um, and in the lower schools, or in the middle school rather, so in our years 9 and 10 and 11, this is um, sort of more prescriptive. Um, but there's all sorts of different, so during the day we have a, a period of time uh, on a Wednesday afternoon for the lower school where they do different types of activities. So this here is a creative writing group, um, but we also have um, sort of things to do with uh, diseases. We have societies, we've got history societies, medical societies, engineering societies. Um, there's a massive, I do uh, encourage you to have a look at the calendars of the schools that you're looking at. Uh, our calendar um, certainly would give you an idea of the kind of societies. Each week we probably have three or four different societies that pupils can go along to, to kind of um, open their horizons. Some might be political, so we might have speakers coming in to talk about politics or law, um, but sort of the, again, the whole person is the whole point. Um, chapel, so I'm the assistant chaplain, um, and actually my, my goddaughter is looking at coming, and, and she said, is, is, is rugby really religious? And I said, um, I said, I, we're, we're not religious in the sense that it's not, it's, it's, it's all about personal contemplation and personal kind of experience. Um, we have a wonderful chapel. Mr. Horner is the chaplain, uh, myself, and Dan Shaw is the other assistant chaplain. We meet um, three times a week during the, the week, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. Um, and it's very short. It's about 20 minutes during the week. And the idea is to have a bit of time of quiet, um, to be thinking about the big questions in life. Um, we, are, we, we do have, uh, um, the, our sort of, our, the school has Christian values, um, but all faiths, uh, or, no, or none, are welcomed. Um, I would encourage you to ask the pupils what they think of chapel um, and there will probably be some kind of kind of chapel type um, thing in all the schools that you, you go to visit. Um, this, we're actually with COVID, we can't all meet together and actually the pupils are really, really sad about that. Um, they, are, they, they thought they would be cancelled together. We have managed to get three houses together and they're very um, happy about that, although we can't sing. And at rugby school we'd like to sing. <laughs> um, Rugby 360, this is our community um, action program, and this is part of our Wednesday afternoon activities. And we think it's really important for students actually not just to be in a little bubble within school. So this is actually social services activity where pupils will go and visit people in um, old people's homes. Um, often that's the highlight of their life. Uh, my uncle is 94 and he has uh, people going to visit him and I can tell you that it's, it really is important to him. There's um, social service music. We go into some um, some sort of youth offenders institutions and do uh, sort of drama. There's riding for the disabled. There's there's ab about 50, 40, yes. about 40 different activities that they can choose from to do when they get into the upper school. Um, and they really, really, really enjoy that. Um, so 360 kind of it's you know looking around at the, the whole uh, the whole of the environment. We don't want to be inward looking but outward looking. Um, and then challenge. Um, at rugby and, at, and at, at many schools, um, the idea of actually sort of trying things that you've never done before and putting yourself in situations which are challenging and kind of test your resilience, you know, can you, your adaptability, your flexibility, um, we think is really, really important. And as a result of that, we have lots of different trips that people can go on. Um, this is a trip to Bolivia. Um, so we have a big trip every two years where the pupils will go for three weeks um, they'll be camping out for three weeks. It's pretty hard, but they grow, you know, it's wonderful. You see them go from teenagers into young adults. Um, I, I happen to have been on quite a few of them. I've been to Peru, um, Nepal, um, Bolivia, Madagascar, and the change in them as they have more autonomy and actually are in an environment opening their eyes to the world is just fantastic. 
Uh, we have sports tours. Um, we have more individual trips as well. Um, so our, our, the idea is that actually we want students to be able to, to, to try as many things as possible um, to challenge themselves. Sometimes they, you know, sometimes things go wrong, but actually that's brilliant because they can learn from those to actually make them able to um, not just kind of survive at university and in later life, but to absolutely flourish and to thrive. And just to finish, really, we're, we're very aware that, that looking after your children is, is very much a partnership between us and you. And we hope that we look after our parents well as well. Um, we expect that our international parents will uh, all have guardians here at school and many of the guardians it's really really important to make sure that you choose the right guardians um, for your children um, but the guardians are a, a real support for the international students because we appreciate that from your perspective um, it's not always possible for you to to, to come over for leave out weekends and exe out weekends which we have <clears throat> wherever possible we will in, um, involve you and, and everything that we do with your children. We've got a very well established now um, a series of parent education seminars, which we run at leave out weekends and half term weekends, where parents who are able to be with us in person um, come and we will deliver sessions around. For example, um, in, a, in a couple of weeks time, Lisa and I will be delivering a session to the new parents about the settling in process, how it's been, um, introducing ourselves uh, and what you can expect from the next five years. Um, the joys of having learned how to do this type of technology so well in the last six months means that we are going to be able to record those sessions and actually to bring international parents in live into those sessions. Um, there are many points of contact for you as parents, um, so the house would be your main point of contact. Um, we encourage our house teams to engage with you in this sort of way, perhaps having your child sitting with me as their tutor so that we can have a conversation with you, the parents, so that you can check in on how they're actually doing. And um, obviously you are very welcome to visit. Although we're a full boarding school, we very much encourage parents um, when you are here um, to come to chapel on Sundays, to take your uh, child out for lunch. Um, if you're flying in maybe just for um, a few days during the week on a business trip, we'd invite you to come to the school to connect up with the teachers, with the house team, and take your child out for supper. Um, but it's very much a partnership and we feel strongly that that is the best way to ensure that your child has the very best journey um, that they can possibly have while they're with us. Um, I think, oh, that's about perfect timing. Um, so if there are any questions, Howard, then Lisa and I'd be very willing to try and answer them. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Sally. Uh, yes, uh, I believe we have time. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, so the first question uh, our viewers have is, what are the main entry points for admissions at rugby? And more specifically, how is the admission process look for a parent from Hong Kong that's interested in applying? Yeah, okay. So the, the main admission points are at 13 plus and 16 plus. Um, we do take into um, a year 10, but a very small number in year 10 um, if spaces become available. Um, how would a parent from Hong Kong apply? Um, really, you would need to go to our website, to the admissions department, um, and to connect there. Um, with, we do encourage, and again, those of you who were listening to what Jennifer said, we very much encourage you um, to come and visit the school in person. At the moment, we would be setting up this sort of virtual um, conversation, um, but we would encourage you to come and visit. We do expect that you will bring your child over for interview, um, to meet the house master, the house mistress, um, and to be interviewed in person. Um, we also run admissions tests, so the admissions tests, um, would be in English and in maths and um, where possible we would expect those to be sat here at school on the day that you come to visit and have your interview. Um, at 16 plus, um, the, if, if you have a child who you think might be coming at 16 plus then you need, um, for example for September 2021, the admissions process will be taking place almost as we speak um, with uh, entrance exams being sat here at school in November. Um, but again, if you are thinking of admission for 2021 or 2022, um, obviously with the COVID situation, things are slightly different. So I would encourage you to get onto the website, look at the admissions department and, and be advised by them. Thank you, Sally. 
And I believe uh, we probably have time for one more question. So the next question is, uh, we can see that sports is, is a big part of rugby school. Now, does rugby offer any scholarships for sports or in financial assistance or aid in general? Yes, we do. Yes, so we have scholarships in, in pretty much every area of school life. So sports scholarships, academic scholarships, um, drama, music, um, design. IT, IT, design, art scholarships. And again, I think if you look on the um, admissions website, the scholarship information is there. But yes, absolutely. And we encourage um, applications. We give a lot of a lot of scholarships out, actually. We're, if the child is right, and they are to the scholarship standard. We don't limit the number of scholarships that we award. We want the right children um, to come here to rugby school. Great, thank you. And thank you, Sally, and thank you, Lisa, for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate all of the insights and information about rugby school. Now, before I let you both go, do you have any parting words for our attendees today? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think my parting word would be that, that here at Rugby, we absolutely believe the whole person is the whole point. Um, I think it's really important that when you visit a school, you find out, is it really full boarding? Because for you as international parents, that is crucial. Is it really full boarding? Is there a proper school community at the weekends? Um, and how, how will you look after my child? Because we, we know that you are giving us your child um, to, to borrow, if you like, and it's very much a partnership. So, so you know, we, we are very appreciative of that. So um, find out what's really going on in school. That's crucial. Thank you, Wallace. Thank you. Lisa, any parting words? No, I, I reiterate that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sally. Thank you very much, Lisa, for joining us. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Matthew Godfrey. He's the Deputy Head of External Relations at Caterham School in Surrey. Good morning, Matthew. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Hi, good morning. Okay, I'm going to introduce you whilst you set up your PowerPoint. Uh, let me tell you a bit about Matthew. Matthew teaches English at Caterham School and he's also the deputy head with responsibility for all admissions. His three children, one daughter and two sons, are all currently studying at Caterham. And over the past 20 years, Matthew has taught in three of the UK's top independent schools. He was a boarding housemaster at Brighton College for six years before moving to Caterham School, where he's been in the post for seven years. Matthew started his career working for Global Management Consult Consultancy, but he describes his decision to train as a teacher, and I quote, one of the best decisions I've ever made, end quote. So true, Matthew. <laughs> very, very good profession to be in. I pass the floor to you. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, and I hope I can be heard, heard loud and clear. Is that yep. correct? Can I be yep. heard? Yep. Good, I thought I should just check. So, um, um, well, good day to everybody who's listening today. It's my pleasure to speak to you here um, from Caterham School. Um, and as you've just heard, I'm Matthew Godfrey. I teach English here, but um, I actually oversee all of the admissions into Caterham School. And so in that capacity, I very much hope that I can welcome you to visit us here um, at our school one day. Um, in fact, we have been so delighted this week, just two days ago, to welcome all of our pupils back into our school. Um, and uh, it's a beautiful day here, and so we're all feeling very positive. Um, particularly after all the difficulties that people have had. So anyway, um, I'm going to go through a few slides now. The first slide here uh, shows our um, school uh, slogan, which is Insp Inspiring Education for Life. Um, uh, uh, I will tell you a little bit about the school today, but it's really important that uh, in our heart here in Caterham School, we want to inspire our pupils. We want them from day one to feel happy here and to go out into the world uh, bolder and better people. Um, so in this picture, you can see uh, a little bit of the valley where Caterham is set. The first thing I want to tell you is we are blessed with a beautiful setting. Uh, we have our own valley here at Caterham. We have 200 acres. Um, there is woodland, there is open space, and there are wonderful facilities. Um, it's also incredibly convenient. Um, we're just basically in South London. Uh, we're very close to Heathrow and Gatwick airports, and so we are accessible. Um, and importantly for all parents, um, it is a very safe campus. Um, because we are blessed uh, to be in a, a village called Caterham, uh, which is just on the edge of London, 
with a train service into London, but it is a very um, quiet um, and safe uh, neighbourhood to be in. Um, and I very much hope, as I say, to welcome you here one day. Um, so, um, Caterham is uh, proudly um, strong with its academics. Um, and uh, we are consistently um, one of the top performing pupils on a number of levels, not least academic results. But most importantly to us, uh, pupils who come here do better than they can expect uh, normally. That is what we call adding value. Um, and at both at GCSE and A level, we have consistently shown that uh, pupils overperform. They do better than they might do elsewhere. And we're very proud of that. Um, I'll come on to the reasons why that is later, but at A-levels, um, we were delighted this year um, that 36% of our grades were the top grade. Um, and uh, that is a record for the school because we seem to be getting a little bit better every year, um, but it has always been the case that our pupils do very well um, at A-level. So those are just some um, figures for you there. Uh, same goes for GCSE. Um, at grade nine, which as you probably know is the top level for GCSE, 40% um, of our grades this year um, were the top grade um, and 66% fell in the top two grades, grades nine um, and eight. And so as it says in italics on the board, the average grade profile for a Caterhamian is 10 grade eights. So um, we're very proud of our pupils. Um, who have performed so well um, over so many years. But you'll notice on this slide at the bottom, um, even though we are proud of our academic performance, uh, we do aim for a balance. Um, and um, uh, we feel we set a perfect balance between um, academic rigor and pastoral welfare. And we see those two things as connected. We think that a, a bright pupil um, who wants to do well academically um, there is no reason why they shouldn't enjoy that aspect of their life, as well as, of course, um, enjoying an environment um, where they feel comfortable, safe and happy. Um, this picture shows some of our pupils outdoors. We are very keen on the outdoors. We are blessed with beautiful sight, uh, including woodland that you see here. So we do want people to get out and enjoy themselves. Um, and you will see that for yourself if you visit us here. Um, Oxbridge is um, an important aspect of life, not the most important, but it is important for you to know that many of our pupils do aspire to go to the top universities. And the numbers on the slide here show you the number of pupils from Caterham School who go to Oxford or Cambridge each year. It represents about 10% of our leavers every year. And uh, we, we are very proud of that record. That is a very good record of success. Um, and um, of course, not everybody wants to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, it, it is really important for you to know that a priority for us um, when your children reach the sixth form is to give them very detailed guidance as to what will happen to them after school. So, uh, as I say, some will want to go to the top universities. Um, some will want to go um, to other universities, maybe Russell Group universities, which are also fantastic universities in the UK increasingly some wish to go abroad and study either back home in the country where they came from um, or or maybe elsewhere but some of them go into business straight away um, and uh, go through a, a, a degree apprenticeship whereby you get the degree uh, while working in the workplace um, anyway so the point is whatever our students aspirations we set the bar high we challenge them to be the very best person they can be um, now, one very important aspect of school life is preparing pupils, as I said, for university and adult life. Um, even though we, have, we are blessed with inspiring teachers, and that is the core of what we do, uh, that is not good enough if the pupils cannot learn for themselves. So we have integrated into our curriculum uh, what we call learning to learn. Um, and so as this picture is designed to sort of demonstrate the ability to learn for yourself and to feel inspired to learn for yourself is an important part of what Caterham does. And um, 
we call it learning to learn. It's all because when the pupils leave the school, um, we want them to feel independent and proud and able to work for themselves. So um, learning to learn is an important part of what we do. Um, now, of course, not everyone has these skills straight away. Um, we did uh, receive an award recently for the Study Buddy program. So when your children, uh, whether they be boys or girls, because of course, uh, Caterham is a co-educational school, when they join the school, uh, they will be given a study buddy, which is a pupil a little bit older than them, who has got to know the way we do things at Caterham, and who meets with them once or twice a week, and just talks to them about how they're getting on, and passes on any wisdom or any experience that they have had, um, which might help the younger pupil. Um, it's also a great way to bring the community together uh, and to get people talking to each other. Um, and that is something I will refer to again later. One thing that perhaps sets Caterham apart from other schools as well is, is what we call digital evolution. Uh, you'll all be aware, I'm sure many of you uh, use technology in your own jobs. Um, and uh, no doubt your, your children also are good with technology. Um, Caterham is an award-winning uh, Apple Distinguished School. Now what that means is even though we still value and cherish conventional teaching, uh, all of us teachers here have been trained to use technology in an innovative um, uh, and educational way. So every pupil who joins our school is given an Apple um, iPad and um, they will use that not only to organise themselves but also it is used as a as a tablet in, in, in schools, in, a very, in classes, sorry, in, an, in a very innovative way. And we were very proud to get this prestigious award uh, about our use of technology. We, we want pupils to understand the power and the use of technology. We also want to teach them about the, uh, uh, some of the dangers, should we say, or some of, the, um, uh, some of the apprehensions people have about technology, not, not to be too dependent on it. So, um, uh, that, that's an important part of what we do here. Okay, so all I'm fully aware as a former housemaster myself that um, you know, you, you'll be interested in who is actually looking after your sons and daughters um, when they arrive in the school. So um, I'm assuming that all of your children will be boarders. Now, Caterham um, has a very interesting organisation, which is that we have a school of about 900 pupil, 930 pupils um, with a smaller boarding community within it. So we have 175 boarders in our school. Um, and um, we think that is just the perfect number because um, it is a very warm and close-knit community, the boarding community where everybody knows each other. Um, we have a wonderful mix of personalities and nationalities in the boarding school. Um, uh, we have about 17 different nationalities at this point in time in the boarding, in the boarding community. Um, and what we find is when the boarders arrive here, they, they feel immediately part of the family. The picture here shows Mrs. Quinton, who is in charge of all the girls um, in the boarding community. Um, but the other advantage uh, the boarders have is that during the day, they are mixing with a much greater pool of people, um, all of whom live relatively locally to the school. Um, so we have British borders, we have international borders, and the day pupils befriend the borders and have lessons with them during the day. So we are fully integrated in that respect. One of the reasons why Caterham is so popular, and um, one of the many reasons, is because of the quality of the boarding provision and the experience the borders have. Um, and um, um, the boarding community is really the, the, the heart and the hub of, of the school. So, um, yeah, th this slide just shows somebody swimming. We have a beautiful swimming pool, um, a 25 meter pool in our sports center here. Um, but the other pictures on the slide just really demonstrate the need and uh, the importance of things outside the classroom. We are a very busy school. And as I speak to you now through that door behind me, there is all sorts of sport going on, socially distanced, of course, um, but the pupils are outside taking exercise getting to know each other. Um, and um, so whether it be music, drama, sport, um, activities of any kind, uh, it is an important part of school life 
We do them at lunchtime during the day, every day, and we do them um, in the evenings as well before um, many of the children go home, and we also do them at the weekends. Um, you may know that Caterham, of course, is famous for its, uh, its school, um, uh, Caterham School, but also it's famous for a make of car called the Caterham Car. This is it on the slide. Really sporty, very fast, little sports car. And uh, every year, um, a team of our pupils come together and make uh, a Caterham car. We are given the kit and they make it and then it is sold back to the company. So it's just one example of what we call the innovative spirit of our school. And we're always looking for new projects, new opportunities for our, our pupils to get involved in. Um, and one, of the, one aspect of that is um, what we call innovative uh, learning, um, which I mentioned briefly. Um, but we want, as the slide says here, we want our students to leave as accomplished problem solvers and innovators. We are trying to educate our children to understand that when they leave us and go into the adult world, well, that world is changing all the time because of technology and different types of jobs. And we want them to be nimble and on their feet so that they are prepared to face any challenge that comes their way. So this um, uh, boy in the slide is, 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 is using an advanced form of Lego to build a robot. Um, it's just one example of the kind of thing that we get our students to do to kind of keep them on their toes outside of lesson time uh, to really develop all sorts of problem solving skills. Okay, um, so we are a globally minded school. We are blessed um, with uh, an international community. Um, we are on the edge of London. Uh, we are an outward looking globally minded school. Um, we keep in touch with all of our pupils once they've left. Um, and we ask our pupils to advise and support, uh, we're sorry, we ask our alumni, our former pupils, to advise and support pupils as they make their decisions, what they're going to do when they leave our school. This slide here also shows the international opportunities that our pupils have. Um, we have uh, sister schools in both the United States of America and also Tanzania, and they're two totally different types of schools. And when they're in the sixth form, our pupils have a chance to go and see them and spend time in there. Um, we also have partnerships with other schools in the UK um, of very different kinds. We believe that it's all part of our experience at Caterham is to get pupils outside their normal comfort zones and witnessing other cultures, seeing the way the world operates on a wider level. Um, okay, so I'm coming towards the end of my presentation now, and I'm looking forward to answering any questions you might have. Um, I think this slide for me is, 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 is important. It just shows how students leave confident in their ability to lead. Now, um, not everyone when they arrive in school um, is a natural leader. Um, if they want to become a leader, we're gonna help them do that. Um, and uh, some pupils may choose as they get older not to be leaders of organizations or whatever but we want them to feel that they can if they want to. So we are a school where we're trying to build dreams and give people the confidence to do whatever it is that they want. Okay, so I've already talked about boarding, but we, we really, uh, I did want to include this slide for you because it's likely your children will be boarders in our school. Um, the bullet points on there show um, everything that we do for the boarders. And I uh, am very proud that particularly um, in Hong Kong and China, we have a long and proud history of welcoming pupils um, uh, who literally, they love our school. And I'm very privileged um, in that I get to visit um, cities in China and I come to Hong Kong once a year. Sadly, I won't be able to come this year because of uh, coronavirus. And every time I go, we have a celebration with our alumni who are now living in those places. And um, they always speak very fondly about Caterham School, um, and uh, that is really important to us. Because let's face it, um, we want our school to be somewhere uh, where they have memories they can cherish. And while some of those memories will be in the classroom, there will be inspiring teachers who they remember for the rest of their lives, the reality is 
many of our best memories at school are collected outside the classroom. And so uh, I did want to just emphasize the point that um, we are a very strong community and um, uh, people who leave Caterham School do so with lifelong friendships. Okay, so I thought it might be helpful just to finish on, uh, on this slide um, because I very much hope that you will be interested in applying to join Caterham School. Uh, we are a very popular school, we are a selective school, it is competitive entry, um, but nonetheless um, uh, we, uh, when we're assessing pupils, we, we don't only look for academic ability, we look for personality and character um, because we want to bring in all sorts of different people into our school. So just a few headlines on the slide there. If you're looking to join us, uh, if your children are looking to join us aged 13 into year nine, the deadline for applications is the 19th of October. Um, and if you do apply for 13 plus, then you will be asked to do entrance papers, which is in maths and English, sometime between now and the 12th of November. Um, and we also interview every single pupil, uh, normally by Skype, but um, it can be done um, in person if you happen to be in the country. Um, similar dates for 16 plus, so we do have pupils joining us just for the last two years, the sixth form at Caterham School. Um, the closing date for those applications is just a little later, 28th of October, um, and pupils who join us for uh, 16 plus, um, that is for our A-level programme, we are an A-level school, um, uh, they will do exams in the subjects they want to study at A-level. It's really just to help us understand what level they have at the moment. Um, and uh, those exams will take place uh, between now and the 12th of November as well. So I put a link on that slide to our admissions website so you can read more about the process. Um, if you have any questions or you want any instructions or any information at all, um, I would encourage you to contact um, my colleague, Mrs. Alison Hill, at that email address. She um, will advise and deal with any kind of um, uh, inquiries about boarding admissions. And of course, she can always refer you to me should you want to know anything more. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you so much for listening. Wallace, I see you've popped up on my screen again. I'm now coming to the end. So I don't know if anyone would like to ask me any questions, but I'm, I'm here to answer if you'd like me to. Shall I stop my slideshow now? Uh, Matthew, you can keep it on. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yes, and uh, I'll begin to ask some of the questions that are coming in. I believe we have time for a few of these questions. Uh, I think the biggest question that uh, we're seeing now with a lot of viewers is, is regarding uh, entry and admissions. Now, first question is, uh, we see that uh, you accept 13 plus and a 16 plus. These are the two main entry points. Does Caterham also accept uh, students that are in between uh, a year 10 student, for example, or if they're 14 or 15 years old? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, one thing I, I, I should say, yeah, well, the main entry points are at 13 plus and 16 plus, year 9 and year 12. However, we do remain, we do keep open a small number of places for year 10 entry. And so just this week, uh, we have had um, some girls and boys joining us as boarders in year 10. So I, I haven't put those dates on there, but they are the same as the 13 plus dates. So if you do want to um, apply for a 14 plus place, that is to join year 10, um, it's the same dates as a 13 plus. Um, I didn't put it on there simply because we have fewer people applying. Um, I should say also, um, um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't need to say anything else, that's fine. It, it's really just 13 plus, 14 plus and 16 plus. Thank you, Matthew. Well, um, except, uh, sorry, I, I remember now what it was. Uh, our senior school actually starts at, in, in year seven. So I'm, I'm mindful that many of your families will not uh, want their children to start in school until 13. However, uh, we do have a day school um, community which starts in year seven. Um, so if there are families who are relocating to the UK and their children can join our school at age 11, um, uh, there is a process involved in that as well. And uh, rather than go on about that now, I will just refer you to the, the website on that. Thank you, Matthew, it's very clear. Now, uh, in terms of the application process and uh, assessments, how would that typically look for a family that's interested in applying from Hong Kong? Yeah, okay, well, it's very straightforward. Um, 
Now, one thing we do ask, if any family is applying from anywhere in the world, including Hong Kong, uh, that we will refer them to one of our trusted agents in Hong Kong. I work very closely, for example, um, in China with BE Education and in Hong Kong with Academic Asia. So if you inquire to our school using the email on this slide, um, one of the things we will do is, is give you the details of our trusted agent in Hong Kong. They know our school very well. They visit us regularly. They are uh, very accustomed to sending people to catering school. And so they have all the information that you need. And if necessary, they can speak to you in your first language as well. Um, anyway, they will deal with the application. But in a nutshell, what will happen is you will have a, an initial conversation with the agent, um, which in Hong Kong is Academic Asia. Um, you will then um, uh, arrange a date um, to have an interview with uh, maybe me or, or one of my colleagues here at Caterham School, uh, which will be arranged via Skype. Um, and you will also arrange to have an exam. And um, uh, there will probably be a, an exam day, which the agent hosts for anyone who's interested in our school. So that's all going to happen between now and November. Um, so as I say, it's an interview and an exam. Um, now, that will all be finished um, uh, by the 12th of November. Uh, we will process all our applications and give you a decision before um, what in the UK we call our Christmas holiday. So by about mid-December. And then um, you will receive an offer or, um, or we'll put you on a waiting list or we'll give you some other kind of response. And then you will have about a month, uh, a little more than a month actually, to consider our offer and to decide whether you're going to accept. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, and just uh, a question about the examination. Uh, what, uh, what subjects will be assessed during the examination? Yeah, good question. So um, at 13 plus, it's quite straightforward. It's a maths exam and an English exam. Um, in the English exam, it, it's a comprehension and a creative writing task. Um, but both exams last only about 45 minutes. Um, at 16 plus, uh, let's say, for example, you've applied to Caterham School to read maths, physics, or maths, further maths, physics, and chemistry, for example. Um, then we will give you uh, an assessment in those three subjects, maths, physics, and chemistry. Of course, we're not expecting you to know all the A-level syllabus at all now, um, but um, we will just be interested to know what level you have. We will also assess your English, just your English written writing skills, uh, because that's the case for all people. We need to know what level of English you have. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that's what the exams involve. As I said, every pupil is interviewed as well. Um, every, every, everyone who does well enough in the exams goes through to a, an interview. Um, yeah. That's what one thing I haven't mentioned is, is visiting our school. Of course, we're living in a strange world now, but it is normally the case that if um, if if pupils are offered a place in our school, they, they normally want to come and visit this school before they commit to coming. And we, of course, we welcome that. We do understand that it might not be possible uh, to do that because of the coronavirus situation. And so we, we will be um, uh, doing lots of virtual visitor mornings. Uh, we will be sending films out of the school. Um, people like me will be available to speak to families if they need to. So if the situation is such that you cannot visit the school before committing your child to come, then we will do all we can. And one thing I didn't mention, I'm sorry if I'm talking too much, everyone who is offered a place in our school uh, will be given the opportunity to, to, to be welcomed by an ambassador family. So for example, families in Hong Kong uh, if your child has been offered a place uh, or even if yeah and you want to talk to another family or several families about their experience at Caterham School then we have plenty of families who are really keen to meet you uh, Caterham families who are living in Hong Kong and uh, they will uh, it would be very be my pleasure to team you up with those families and to uh, just, just so you can feel more confident about the process. Thank you, Matthew. And, and just to uh, touch up upon that, um, I assume, uh, are, are there any differences for the exam between, you know, 13, 14, 15, and 16 uh, years old? Um, do you mean the exams that they do to gain entry into our school? Correct, for the main entry points, correct. Um, 
the main, the, uh, all pupils do the same exam, if, that, if that's what you mean. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I see, what, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yes, it, it, 13 plus. And so if you're, the exams you do at 13 plus entry are a little bit different to the ones for 14 plus, only because we might expect at age 14 for them to have a bit more mathematical knowledge. Um, and also we don't want all the exams to be the same because um, the children of course will talk to each other about their exams. So no, they're, they're a little bit different. Uh, the, the tests that they do at 14 plus a little bit more demanding than the ones they do at 13 plus and at 16 plus a little bit more demanding still. Um, yeah, um, as I said, we are academically selective, but we don't, we don't place all our importance on academic achievement. So it's very important for your candidates or your pupils to, to, to remember that even if they feel an exam hasn't gone that well, we still will be looking at their school report. We still will be talking to them in an interview and we will be looking at the whole picture not just their performance on one exam on one day. Great, thank you, Matthew. And uh, I believe that's all the time that we have. Now, before I let you go, uh, again, thank you for joining us. It's great to know uh, all of this about Cater. Um, um, do you have any parting words for our attendees and viewers today? Um, well, maybe just one thing, uh, well, two if I may. Firstly, uh, I, I know what it's like when you're a long way away from a school like ours really uh, the ideal thing is to to either speak to people who know our school or maybe come and visit our school and we, we will do all that we can to make both of those things possible the second thing i wanted to say is i'm very mindful of the the difficult situation uh, we are all in with um schools sometimes having to close i know that in hong kong schools are not yet open um but one thing uh, that has been a great comfort to our parents at caterham school is, is that our quality of digital learning, uh, sort of di virtual learning has been excellent. And so um, when our school, like every other school, uh, pretty much in the world had to close down, uh, we did find that our pupils engaged very well with our virtual learning program. Um, and actually we have one or two pupils who've been delayed arriving in school this, uh, this term, but um, they are still very engaged in the school. Uh, attending all of their lessons virtually because each of our um, classrooms has a camera in it and so even if the, the child cannot be there in person they are very much part of the the, the lesson so um, uh, of course we all hope that the coronavirus nightmare will end altogether very soon but it is some comfort to parents I think that whatever happens at Caterham School we're, we're going to remain connected and uh, the pupils will continue to learn and be um, inspired by their teachers. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much, Matthew. Great to hear from you and for all of that information about Caterham and their, uh, their um, inspiring education uh, for life. Um, obviously, from my, well, maybe not so obviously, but from my own career, it's the school I know the best, and my two children were certainly inspired for life by having been through Caterham. So, thank you very much uh, for being with us. And, and that brings us, Matthew brings us very neatly to the end of our webinar for this afternoon, the end of the first third of the uh, British Boarding Schools Festival. Um, we have another two Saturdays to offer you. Uh, but I would like to thank all of our speakers today. Uh, I'd like to thank Wallace and Nicola on the Wickham Abbey Hong Kong team for being with us this afternoon. A very special thank you again to Ruth Benny and Top Schools for hosting us on their uh, Zoom platform for this very large group of people and a very special thank you to everybody in the audience. We hope you found it useful and informative. If there are any of the many details you think you've missed, please don't worry, please don't panic. Um, I'm about to share my screen so that you can see the contact details for us um, and anything you've missed for any of the schools, do get in touch with us here. Ask for Wallace or myself and we'll happily put you in touch with anybody from Marlborough, uh, from Sevenoaks, from Rugby School, or from Catrum, uh, or indeed with um, Jennifer Ma from Arch Education. So thank you very much to all our speakers. We look forward to seeing you next week when we welcome Down House, Wickham Abbey in Britain, uh, Cheltenham Ladies College, St Mary's Khan, Badminton, and our local speaker will be Emma van Bergen uh, from BE Education. So thank you very much, everybody, and good evening.